Good afternoon and welcome to Joining Forces to Address Cyber Risks. I'm Franca Palazzo. I'm Executive Director of the Internet Society Canada Chapter. I'm thrilled to say we have an exceptional lineup of expert speakers for today. For the sake of time, I will be introducing speakers by name and title only. You can find all of their bios on our website at internetsociety.ca. I'd like to particularly acknowledge and thank the, His Excellency Ambassador David L. Cohen, the Honorable Marco Mendicino, Minister of Public Safety, Parliamentary Secretary to the President of the Queen's Privy Council for Canada and Minister of Emergency Preparedness, MP for Ottawa Centre. Thank you all for participating. I would like to begin by acknowledging that the land in which we gather is the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. And now just a brief introduction of who we are as an organization. The Internet Society Canada chapter is a not-for-profit who advocate on behalf of Canadian citizens for an affordable, accessible, safe and open internet. We've had our work cut out for us on many issues lately, Bill C-11 and online harms, to name a couple. Cybersecurity is one of the many issues we are working on. Today's discussion is part of an ongoing project focused on cybersecurity threats for Canadians. This project was launched with the support of the U.S. Embassy, and I want to thank them for their support and for co-hosting today's event. A special thank you to Kate Brown, Damon Dubord, and Zachary Bailey for all their work in making today success. Since our launch in late 2019, we have gained many partners who have contributed to the project. I'd like to thank Amazon Web Services for being a valued partner right from the beginning and for co-sponsoring today's event. A special thank you to Catherine Fortin Lefebvre and Alex Mayu for all of their hard work to make today a success. AWS is a trusted cloud service provider of choice for governments around the world. They provide highly reliable, scalable, secure, and low-cost infrastructure and on-demand services that power over 7,500 government agencies, over 14,000 academic institutions, and over 35,000 not-for-profit organizations around the world. Security is AWS's top priority. Their data centers and network architecture are built to meet the requirements of the most security sensitive organizations. Again, we're thrilled to have them as our partner. Today we will be focusing on how G7 nations can enhance collaboration against ransomware and other threats to our national security and economy. Our first panel will discuss the weaponization of cybercrime as a threat to our democracy. And panel two will look at cyber warfare in the age of renewed Russian aggression. This event is being recorded and a link will be available tomorrow and I would encourage you to share that with your networks. So without further ado, I would like to, it is my honor to introduce His Excellency Ambassador David L. Cohen to provide opening remarks. I'll, I'll address this to David level. So thanks very much and, uh, and good afternoon, everyone. I have to say, I, it's a legitimate smile on my face because I look out and what I say what a wonderful opportunity it is. I've been here since December 1st. This may be the second time that I've been in this room and there've actually been people here. <laughs> um, so it's really nice to see um, a real group of people gathered here and I wanna welcome everyone. Um, I wanna start with some welcomes and thanks um, with apologies, I'm going first, so I have a lot of them. Um, but obviously want to welcome all of our guests here. Um, and um, this is a hybrid event, as Frank has said. So I hope everyone who's watching us um, enjoys the event as well. Um, it's also a personal pleasure and a real personal pleasure for me to appear with our strong law enforcement and cybersecurity partner, Minister Marco Mendocino. Um, I was very pleased to hear um, about the minister's participation 
in the cross-border crime forum in Washington earlier this week. Um, we had a chance to chat about that a little bit before this. Um, and I said to him jokingly, um, it's nice It's nice to have something like that that happens once every 10 years. And he, of course, said it would be better if it happened more frequently than that. But it has been 10 years since that group was pulled together. Some of that COVID-related, some of it um, other, but a really incredibly productive um, discussion uh, with Canada and the United States and critical players on both sides of, of the border. And I think the forum itself underscores the deep law enforcement our, our governments have. Um, and Marco Mendocino is right in the center of that. And um, it's been a pleasure to get to know him and call him a friend as well as a colleague. Um, I have to admit, though, and I can say this because he really has become a friend, um, that I'm only a little bit jealous that he was able to experience the Washington cherry blossom season. He told me in full bloom, I mean, not just the beginning, but in full bloom. Um, and, and I think the best I can say is as we prepare for spring in Ottawa. I don't, I don't think I can I don't think I can call this spring yet and I've been warned not to be fooled by the weather over the last week to 10 days. We could still get three snowstorms before we actually before we actually get to spring. But I'm still talking to you Marco. I, I mean if someone had to enjoy it, I'm glad it was you. Um, so I also want to thank Eric Belzeal, the Director General of the Canadian Cyber Center's Incident Management and Threat Mitigation Directorate for his participation. Along with my embassy colleagues, we value your continued partnership to counter cyber threats. I must also thank the Internet Society of Canada for partnering with the U.S. Embassy today with a special thanks to Franca for her ongoing organizational efforts. That's it for my thanks for now, anyway. Um, sometimes I look around the room and I'm wondering if people are saying, well, gee whiz, thanked everyone in the room but me. But I, I thanked everyone. I started by thanking everyone. So the United States and its allies face an increasingly complex and interconnected global security environment with cyber threats emanating from both state actors and cyber criminals. We do not have to look farther than Russia's invasion of Ukraine to see cyber threats at the center of the world stage. During this conflict, Russia has conducted cyber attacks on government ministries and on major banks. On Monday, the Biden-Harris administration warned that Russia could engage in malicious cyber activity against the United States in response to the unprecedented economic sanctions that we and others have imposed. That warning is based on evolving intelligence that Russia might be exploring options for potential cyber attacks. The threats are very real for governments and for industry and for our critical infrastructure too. We should not take this lightly. Um, I'll remind everyone that the intelligence around Russia's activities in and around Ukraine has been pretty close to flawless. So that was a serious warning um, and with purpose. The 2022 U.S. intelligence community's annual threat assessment <clears throat> found that competition and potential conflict between nation states remains a critical national st security threat. <clears throat> the report found that China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea are exercising their military and cyber capabilities, raising risks to U.S. and allied forces weakening our conventional deterrence and increasing the longstanding threat from weapons of mass destruction. <clears throat> Transnational cyber criminals are also increasing the number, scale, and sophistication of their ransomware attacks. These attacks threaten to disrupt critical services globally. Cyber criminals continue to utilize extortion and ransomware to commit wire fraud. Attackers are increasingly targeting businesses with low levels of resilience or whose consumers are sensitive to service disruptions, which is driving up ransomware demands and payouts. 
These state and non-state cyber actors are building their capabilities to target critical infrastructure, which could disrupt many industries, including oil and glass pipelines, rail systems, underwater cables, and industrial control systems. This presents a real security threat to the United States and our allies. I feel like I'm preaching to the choir in this, but when I, I've talked about this subject a fair amount, and half the time when I talk about it, people think it's science fiction. It's hard to focus on it, but this is as real as it can possibly be. So as we will discuss today, cyber threats are straddling both the national security and criminal arenas. This hybrid cyber threat, such as Russian-based actors conducting cyber criminal activities against critical infrastructure, has a number of features. Decentralized and globally dispersed teams are perpetrating cyber crimes from foreign technology platforms that are difficult to reach. Cyber actors often operate beyond Canadian and U.S. borders, frequently in adversarial countries or countries that are not easily accessible to law enforcement. But the impact of their actions are felt across borders in our countries. These cyber actors are becoming faster, more sophisticated, more nimble, and adaptive in their tactics. The Biden-Harris administration views cybersecurity as both a national security and an economic security imperative. Accordingly, we are prioritizing this issue like never before. Internationally, the Biden-Harris administration brought together over 30 countries, including Canada, to counter ransomware attacks through the Counter Ransomware Initiative. The administration also rallied G7 countries to hold nations who harbor ransomware criminals accountable and has worked with partners to update the NATO cyber policy for the first time in seven years. And I must say, when you're dealing with something like a cyber policy, to wait seven years to update it, I mean, this, these are... I don't, these are more than dog years. It's, it's like waiting a lifetime to wait seven years to update your cyber policies and tactics. The administration is also engaging the private sector to prioritize cybersecurity in order to maintain business continuity and resilience. Bottom line, we must act together to hold cyber criminals accountable. Since ransomware and other cyber actions are transnational, they require timely and consistent collaboration across law enforcement, national security authorities, cybersecurity agencies, and financial intelligence units married with the private sector. The U.S. government is committed to increasing the flow of information and providing assistance internationally. We will consider the use of all tools available against those responsible for cyber attacks that threaten critical infrastructure and public safety. And this is something that Minister Mendocino and I just talked about because as with so much that is going on in the world today, take Russia, Ukraine, take climate change. This is a place where U.S. and Canada working together can lead and can have an enormous impact on every other democracy in the world. And so it's why the Cross-Border Crime Forum, Forum was so important, and it's why all the relationships that we have with our Canadian counterparts um, is so important to achieving this very significant goal. So all this is a, although this is a bit scary, we should all welcome today's discussions on the changing cybersecurity threat environment and the ways the United States and Canada can better work together to counter this threat. Our joint action to address malicious cyber threats is more important than ever. And as with so many other difficult global issues, Canada is our critical partner. So thank you all and enjoy the rest of the program.
Thank you, Ambassador Cohen. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce the Honorable Marco Mendicino, Minister of Public Safety and Member of Parliament representing Eglinton Lawrence, Ontario. I, ho I use the Italian pronunciation. I hope that's okay. <laughs> Well, uh, bonjour tout le monde. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the introduction. And uh, Ambassador David, uh, always good to see you, my friend. Uh, it's also a pleasure to be joined by my uh, friend and colleague, uh, the local member of parliament, Yasser Nakfi, the parliamentary secretary to the Minister of Emergency Preparedness. Um, and indeed, I uh, just want to acknowledge as well that we are uh, having this wonderful meeting on the traditional territories of the Algonquin peoples. Um, look, I have some uh, prepared remarks, but before uh, I come to that, I just really want to take a moment to acknowledge um, the friendship that, that you and I have struck up, David, uh, since you got here. You know, he was chiding me a little bit about uh, visiting uh, Washington, D.C. Um, and, and the country uh, that, uh, that he uh, sorely misses, but I hope you're settling in. There is no greater way uh, to clear your headspace with an early morning run. And I have to tell you, Washington, D.C. provided a perfect backdrop a couple mornings ago, about 6.30 in the morning. I got up still pretty dark. Uh, but very uh, peaceful and serene, uh, ran from Noma uh, to the uh, Lincoln Memorial and saw the sunrise come up over the, uh, the Capitol Hill. And um, uh, it's true, the uh, cherry blossoms were uh, in full bloom while I was there. But as a note of encouragement, uh, Ambassador, uh, the Tulip Festival in Ottawa is coming. <laughs> and uh, you will have an opportunity to see some of uh, the finer elements of spring here in Canada. And of course, in winter, don't forget, you've got beaver tails and winter lewds. So I'm promoting all kinds of local businesses for Yasser and he's giving me uh, the thumbs up. But we are so uh, grateful uh, to you uh, for your service and your friendship um, in Canada-US relations. And we know that uh, there's a lot of uh, important work to do. Um, I did just get back uh, from uh, Washington, D.C., where we dusted off the cross-border crime forum. Um, Secretary Mayorkas, uh, with whom I've got also a very strong uh, rapport and friendship, will leave for another day our rivalry in baseball. Um, but we talked last uh, fall in November uh, at the North American Leadership Summit um, about um, rebooting this, this, this forum, uh, precisely because of the very complex uh, environment uh, within which uh, Canada and the United States and indeed all Western democracies uh, are, are, are encountering numerous new challenges and emerging threats. And uh, whether it's in the context of uh, cyber attacks uh, and cyber security, uh, ideologically motivated extremism, as I think both of our countries have encountered over the past uh, a short while, um, fighting uh, gun crime and contraband across our two borders. Um, there is plenty of room uh, for ongoing uh, success and collaboration. And I just really want to take a moment uh, to thank um, the Biden administration, Secretary Mayorkas, uh, Attorney General uh, Garland and all of the agencies who are doing extraordinary work um, on the front lines every day to keep our borders uh, secure and safe so that uh, we can continue to drive uh, trade and travel. Uh, after two long years, uh, there's a lot of pent up demand, I think, uh, not only uh, here on the North American continent, but right around the world. And in order to get back to pre-COVID normal, uh, we've got to make sure that we get security right. And uh, I certainly felt as though there was just enormous goodwill uh, at the table on a wide range of issues, including when it comes to uh, ensuring uh, cybersecurity, which is going to be the subject of the discussion today. I'll also just quickly update you, uh, you all that um, this morning I had a, a call uh, with other G7 uh, interior ministers where we talked about the situation in Ukraine. And here as well, I think it's um, essential and critical that Canada and the United States uh, stand firm with um, all Western democracies and allies to push back against the illegal invasion that is being undertaken by uh, Mr. Putin. We talked about uh, the need to continue to deliver um, support in the form of military aid, uh, to continue to be innovative uh, when it comes to um, imposing sanctions, which are dealing devastating blows to the Russian economy. And uh, perhaps most importantly and urgently, uh, to find ways to create uh, humanitarian corridors to address the 3.5 million Ukrainians who have had to flee their homes because of the rocketed attacks, which are raising apartment buildings and maternity wards. And um, it is absolutely gut-wrenching uh, to see these images reported day in and day out. And despite all of that, we see President Zelensky 
and the Ukrainian people fighting back. And I think we owe it to them. It behooves all of us to find ways uh, to do whatever we can to support them, their sovereignty, and their ability to survive. And we will do that. Now, against all of that, um, we are, are on high alert, as you heard the ambassador say, um, that, uh, that we should anticipate uh, that Russia, which is a well-known and notorious uh, belligerent actor in cyberspace, uh, will attack. Uh, will attack um, either our critical infrastructure um, or will use cyber to, um, to create foreign influence uh, for the purposes of uh, coercing or distorting, uh, uh, coercing uh, the diasporas that are here, including the Ukrainian communities in both of our countries, or distorting what is actually happening, happening in Ukraine. And uh, we are operating in a high environment of disinformation. Uh, we're looking at our tools here uh, in the Canadian government, and I know as well in the United States, uh, to make sure that the, that the facts remain clear and that what is going on in Ukraine um, is not only gravely concerning, um, but it, it, it reaches to the occasion of war crimes. And we need to be very clear-eyed about that. Um, this is an illegal invasion. People are dying, and it's wrong. Um, let me say a few words uh, about um, ransomware, because uh, I know that that is going to be one of the, the topics that is going to uh, be delved into with some substance today. Uh, I want to uh, thank um, the, uh, the Internet Society, as well as AWS, uh, for, uh, for facilitating this discussion. Um, we've seen an alarming um, increase in ransomware attacks, uh, small businesses, medium-sized enterprises, uh, right across the economy, different levels of government, uh, who are, I think, reaching out uh, to, uh, to us and to, I'm sure, many of you for, for guidance and support. Um, I want to thank the many uh, partners within uh, the Canadian government who have provided uh, declassified um, guidance around cyber hygiene. I mean, there are some very uh, common sense things that folks ought to be doing around two-factor authentication and passwords. And when you travel, making sure that, you know, you're keeping your uh, devices uh, at bay where appropriate. There, there are all kinds of, I think, ways in which um, the economy can and should be innovating to protect itself uh, from the new threats which are emerging as a result of, of ransomware. I, I think when it comes to our two countries, Ambassador, I know that there is, again, a real a depth of goodwill to share intelligence and information so that we can uh, detect and deter and disrupt um, emerging trends around ransomware from uh, known and unknown um, uh, belligerent actors. And I know that, um, you know, beyond that, uh, that there will be new technologies that will emerge to allow us to, uh, to mitigate against that. I think that, uh, you know, I, I, I think I'll probably stop right here because I know that there's going to be a, a real um, opportunity for uh, the experts to get into it. But I just really want to uh, take the opportunity again for the chance to come and see you, Ambassador, uh, in, your, in your home here. And I hope you're getting settled in. And I want to thank all of the, uh, the hosts today for, uh, for, for facilitating this great discussion. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Thank you, Minister. <clears throat> we now have a pre-recorded video address by Chief Clarence Louis, Chairman of the Indigenous Tech AI Corporation. Good afternoon. My name is Chief Clarence Louis. In addition to being an elected First Nation Chief with the Sioux Indian Band in BC, I'm also Chairman of Indigenous Tech corporation and major shareholder. I would like to start by recognizing this event is being hosted on American soil at the embassy in Ottawa. I thank the ambassador, the Internet Society, Canadian chapter, Amazon Web Services, and other members of parliament and distinguished, and distinguished government representatives from many Canadian and U.S. institutions for inviting me and my team to the event. I will start today with a brief blessing of this function in some words in the Okanagan language. Why chasal halt e siluch? Hello, it's a good day today, my relatives. The reason I agreed to make this video is to support economic reconciliation for indigenous people and businesses. Canada cannot have reconciliation without economic participation from Indigenous peoples. Unfortunately, 
indigenous participation in the IT security field is below 1%, which is a fraction of our population in Canada, which is closer to 5%. IT data and network security is extremely important. To illustrate the importance of security, one only needs to look at Canada's most northern territory, none of it, in the recent hack. Essentially, their entire IT infrastructure in Iqaluit was taken down with ransomware. No, so, no social service checks were issued. Critical shipments of food and supplies were distributed in medical systems were compromised. Indigenous people are coming back into focus with the invasion of Ukraine. Our North is at risk and it will be Indigenous populations that will help patrol, secure and protect Canada from Russian threats. Now more than ever, we need to be partners with the US and Canada on defense of freedom. My business partner and president of our company, Murray Rowe, has asked me to make special recognition of AWS. We appreciate your sincere efforts to work with our company. Together, we will accomplish great things. Specifically, I appreciate AWS agreeing to support our Indigenous Technology Summit in the East Coast this summer and the Indigenous Technology Intern Program that has been doubled this year. I also wish to thank Shared Services Canada and the Communications Security Establishment of Canada, CSEC, for their commitment to participate in our youth programs and to host cybersecurity training for Indigenous communities. Now more than ever, we need to appreciate one another in the importance of global alliances. Peace be with you. Have a great conference. Thank you to Chief Louis and uh, Murray Rowe from Indigenous Tech AI for preparing that video for us. And now, if I could ask the participants for the first panel to make their way up to the stage. <laughs> our moderator for um, both of our panels today is Brent Arnold, Partner and Technology Subgroup Leader, Commercial Litigation for Gowlings, WL WLG Canada. Uh, Brent is also secretary and a board director for the Internet Society Canada chapter. Brent, hand it to you. All right, actually, I've got one right here. Thank you, Franca, and uh, thank you everybody for being here today. Uh, I'm delighted to be sitting here talking about these important issues instead of, uh, well, just suing people over them. So it's uh, I'm looking forward to an exciting discussion here. Uh, as Franca said, we're just going to introduce people by title very quickly. Their bios are impressive and voluminous, uh, and you can look them up if you want more information. Uh, I might ask each of you just to put your hand up as we haven't uh, put you in rectangles with your names appearing on them as in Zoom as we're all used to. So if you could just raise your hand so everyone knows who you are. I'd like to start with uh, our guest, Brian Abalera, who is a FBI Supervisory Special Agent and Assistant Legal uh, Attaché Cyber. We have Chris Lynham from the Canadian Cybercrime Coordination Unit and Canadian Anti-Fraud Center of the RCMP. Welcome. We have Sean Roche, uh, Director and National Security, uh, of National Security for Amazon Web Services, joining us here today uh, in the international public sector. Thanks for coming. And we have uh, Eric uh, Belzile, Director General, Incident Management and Threat Mitigation at the Canadian Center for Cybersecurity, which uh, we will be hearing more about today. Uh, thank you all. Uh, as I have told uh, our uh, panelists, we have a lot of questions we could get to, but I think it's more important that we have uh, a really uh, multifaceted and engaged discussion. So we're going to do that. We've only got an hour. Uh, but if there's time at the end, uh, we will be turning to the audience for suggestions. And then the panelists will act out some brief comedy sketches based on those audience suggestions. <laughs> 
Finger or possibly not. Finger pops. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that, back to a serious topic uh, for serious people. Uh, let me just sort of set the stage. Uh, and I, and I know we know these things, but it's, it's a good focusing exercise, I think. So I'm going to give you some uh, statistics here. Ransomware, as we all know, it was a serious problem pre-pandemic, but arguably one that was underrepresented in the national conversation uh, and not perhaps taken as seriously as it should have been by Canadian uh, business. Uh, it exploded during the pandemic, as everyone on this panel uh, has lived through. Uh, and it's much more part of our, our, our discussion these days. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was in Vancouver when TELUS released, released its 2022 ransomware report. Uh, so this is almost off on, hot off the press, and it's as alarming as you would expect. Um, in, in pulling hundreds of respondents' companies, uh, they were, uh, respondents reported that 83% of them had experienced a cyber attack. Of those, 67% experienced an actual ransomware incident, meaning uh, a successful breach of uh, defenses, even if it didn't result in encryption or exfiltration, uh, but that alone is alarming. 44% of those uh, polled who experienced an event actually paid the rans ransom. 24% spent weeks to months containing and eradicating the ransomware incident. And this was a surprise to me, but to me is the most alarming uh, statistic. 15% of the companies that suffered a successful ransomware attack were then reinfected after recovery. Uh, so that's, that's the game we're playing, unfortunately. So I'm going to uh, start by directing some questions uh, to each of the panelists. But as I said, please, please jump in. Feel free to disagree with each other. I think there's a lot of different uh, facets to this. Uh, starting with the law enforcement angle, I'd like to talk to Brian and Chris and ask you, how are cyber threats evolving, uh, specific to ransomware? What type of cooperation are we seeing in the global community to counter those threats? Brian, do you want to go first? Yourself? Sure, sure. Thank you. Oh, yes. Sure. feel like a superstar. <laughs> Thank you. When I first arrived in May, uh, the way in which the FBI handled the portfolio with ransomware and just in cybersecurity in general, was that we would we would qualify cybersecurity incidents as national security related or criminal related. And just in that short amount of time since being here, I've seen those two converge. And we call that that hybrid cyber threat, where you have operators working in malign countries conducting cyber crime acts against cross-border US and Canadian critical infrastructure. And I've been and as I've been looking through my portfolio of which these sort of situations are now dominating all the work that it is I'm doing. Some of the key things I wrote down is that this space is becoming professionalized. These ransomware actors provide customer service to these victims. If you don't know how to pay the ransom, then they'll help you out with that. If you pay the ransom and you're having ish, uh, problems applying the key that they provide you, they'll also help you get your data back as well, and they'll coach you through the process, if you will. In addition, most recently we've seen, we've seen other categories of cybersecurity move into the space, especially with what's happening in Ukraine. Uh, we're seeing ransomware actors uh, citing affiliation, not affiliation, but endorsing what is happening out there. And now we're seeing the hacktivist component coming into the ransomware space, then further complicating, and then in turn short-circuiting short the way in which we do business, where we want to qualify this as national security, criminal, hacktivism, et cetera, et cetera, when all of it is both, and even further complicating this matter finally, is that we're sworn to protect US, US and American partners and also Canadian infrastructure and the victims reside here within our borders. How are the actors sit well within the reaches of our jurisdictions? And the evidence that is holding a lot of this data is sitting in countries that are extremely hard to reach as well. So that's the space. What we've seen is a reaction from the Canadian side and from the US side is the emergence of very many units, new, uh, to address this hybrid space. Further, we've seen traditional intelligence community components moving into the cybercrime arena, taking on a cybercrime as a national security approach, and from the criminal side, also them broadening their portfolio into the national, secure, national security arena as well. 
Thank you, Chris. Sure. Is this on? Okay. Um, yeah, I, I would echo uh, very much what Brian said, and then even you know Ambassador Cohen's comments where he said, you know, cyber criminals are you know moving faster, being more nimble, and being adaptive. I I often say that I think cyber criminals are some of the most innovative, uh, adaptive people on the planet. They will figure a way to change their model um, to to cause the most impact. Um, you know, you see things where. You know, five years ago, there was a focus on on spray attacks where you you were just they were trying to trying to uh, attack as many victims as they could to move towards more big game hunting, which is which is happening now to get those those juiciest targets that might pay the most. But now there's even maybe some some thoughts that well to maybe stay under the radar because there's been so much attention. Are they going to move back to to more of that that spray approach? Um, the other challenges I agree with Brian that you know very organized operate very much like organizations, um, but at the same time, they've adopted a model we call the affiliate model, where it's not, in traditional organized crime, it was a very uh, closed group that you only worked for that group, and now it's an affiliate model. There's some there's analogies to the, to the gig economy where they will move from group to group or wherever the, the contract relies, and that, from a law enforcement perspective and others, that makes it very difficult to first understand who's playing in this space and then, and then go after them. Um, I, I would I would echo that that you know to to address this it really requires a new way of doing it uh, or expanding a level of what we're doing now where um, organizations or police services um, can't can't tackle this alone at their level it's all got to be connected nationally and then internationally um, and we've seen in the last few years where where countries like Canada the U S and others have really tried to up that um, whether it's it's the RCMP or the FBI coming together and figuring out how to work together closely, whether it's through groups uh, that exist uh, through the Europol model of the Joint Cybercrime Action Task Force, which which both the FBI and the RCMP have members on, have really come to that collective way um, to address this. I, I would say five years ago, you know, it, this global co cooperation between law enforcement, other security agencies, the private sector, it was seen as a, okay, we, sh we should do it. But now it is absolutely a must ha have. Um, you're, if, you're, if you're doing something in isolation, you're, you're not effective in this space whatsoever. And, and really, we've only got to con continue that going forward if we're going to really tackle this uh, appropriately. Thank you. Uh, on the theme of collaboration, I want to turn to you, Eric, uh, and, and, and ask you, can you tell us uh, how can government and the private sector work together to combat this threat? I mean, your own center, I think, is an excellent example of, of how some of that work is done. Another one that comes to mind for me is participation in the Canadian Cyber Threat Exchange. So give us your thoughts. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, happy to be here this afternoon. Thanks for the invitation. Um, yeah, I, I think on, on that point, um, uh, we, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Uh, I think I've just looked back to a few years ago, I have Chris here sitting uh, next to me. Uh, there was not a, a lot of discussion at the federal government uh, in terms of, of um, uh, dealing with that threats and, and all the all, all that's happening in cyberspace. Uh, in the last few years, we have actually integrated uh, a lot of our functions. We have processed a lot of sharing of information. It's actually coordination to uh, uh, notify victims and assess the victims in uh, recovering from those cyber incidents and also ensuring that they uh, report to law enforcement to make sure there's criminal investigation following those. So from a federal government perspective, still under development, we're doing a lot of collaboration in that space. And actually I just had a discussion with Brian before the meeting today about how we can further uh, do that collaboration with, uh, with the US on, on many aspects. So I know Chris is working with them by the FBI, but I think we can work more globally, uh, globally on that. I think um, with the private sector, I think there's a, a question of maturity also from their side. And, and um, for them, reporting to us is very important. Uh, we are often in the um, incident response space. Like I, I live that uh, day in, day out. That's uh, what the, my function is at the cyber center. We see all those victims of cyber incident in government, in uh, other level of governments, in provincial, municipals, and also in the private sector. And, we need to get ahead of the curve. Like we have to help them, uh, and that start with reporting. Uh, we need we need to encourage them to report to us, uh, so we can use uh, the information we get from those incidents, uh, the TTPs, like the the tactics, the uh, signatures, and be able as a cyber center be able to share that information back to the different sector of the in the private sector. So sometimes we see campaigns starting. Uh, we have one victims two in a specific sector. 
So we start to wondering what's happening and we, we have to quickly react and, and send information to those organizations so they make sure they shield their systems, uh, use those indicators to, to protect themselves. Um, more specifically with the private sector, we work with uh, the key uh, IT operator in Canada, like the network, uh, we work like network service providers, uh, we work with the cloud service providers, so making sure that uh, we work with them on um, securing their infrastructure uh, so their clients can benefit from the security that they put in place, the monitoring, uh, the controls that they have to, to uh, stop those threats uh, coming at them. We have some partnership with the telecom industry where we um, uh, invite them to maybe do some blocking upstream, so making sure that we can, uh, all Canadian in general can can uh, benefit from those um, those security controls. So um, a lot of, of collaborations uh, with the key uh, IT service providers, uh, but we need to to work more in real time and get uh, ahead of those uh, of those threats. So I think there's a lot more opportunities that we're not uh, taking from from that environment. Um, so there's gap in sharing. There's uh, we, like some of the gaps that we still need to work on is uh, sharing on on the reporting. Also on the maturity of those organizations. Like those organizations are often not ready to respond to those incidents. They call us. They're completely lost. They don't believe. It's happening to them, uh, and they don't understand quickly the magnitude of those incidents. Sometimes it takes two, one or two days for them to uh, to understand what really happened to them, and they will be out of commissions for a number of days. So uh, the outreach we have at the Cyber Center, like our partnership program, where we meet organization in different sectors, and uh, that's part of the. Um, promoting those best practices and securities that they have, they have to put in place. Absolutely, and you know, if anyone hasn't spent time on the center's website, I encourage you to do that. There's some terrific resources that I am frequently recommending to sort of small and mid-sized clients in particular that need to sort of get up to speed on these things. You mentioned the cloud service providers, which gives me a chance to surprise Sean and bring him into this discussion because Amazon is obviously a very mature and very important player in this space, uh, being, I, I, I assume, the, the largest or certainly one of the largest cloud providers. Uh, so can you sort of give us the private sector perspective on that collaborative uh, aspect? Absolutely. So every time um, the, the, the cloud client and customer relationship is really an intimate relationship that starts with security as a basis. The cloud was designed for security and the client service system, it was added on later, the threat added on later. I think the big inflection point was the deployment of uh, network common networking software packages like Windows XP was kind of an inflection point of the great news is we're all connected, the bad news is we're all connected. <laughs> so in Amazon, the approach is uh, the, the new uh, phrase is zero trust. And zero trust, by the way, is a concept and a methodology and a mindset. Some folks are turning it into a checklist. Those checklists get outdated pretty quickly, as we know. So Amazon's been at zero trust for nine years. And, uh, and by the way, they had the toughest client in the world for this, the CIA. <laughs> and actually, to be clear, it was 17 agencies across the US intelligence community, and most of which had never seen a cloud before. So security is job zero. It is, it's just the base of everything we do with customers that increasingly are uh, seeing larger and larger workloads into, across international space and when we say critical infrastructure, last year that probably had a, two years ago, that probably had a different definition when I was consulting than it does now. It's expanding. It really seems to include everyone. Um, getting out means of information through, for instance, cable providers, which our ambassador would know something about, is, is increasing. That's critical infrastructure. Well, where Amazon goes is they never stop. We, our, our approach is to never stop uh, innovating in security space to understand the most sophisticated attacks, and most importantly, the new trend, I'd say the discussion that we're having more with our customer is deep levels of resiliency. So it's gotta be, we've heard the word respond, we've heard the word recover, and then we've maybe heard the word reconstitute, but it's all of those have to be in place and tested regularly with resources to make it more resilient. So that's the growing trend is this, this is not IT. You're not providing me with IT. These are mission essential services that have to be resilient at a digital level globally. 
Right. And I know that, I mean, I think we all know that resilience often comes down to, among other things, process and planning, but a piece of that is, is technology. Can you give us, while you have the mic, a, a glimpse of what the future might look like on that with respect to, let's say, artificial intelligence or machine learning? It, the, 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 the challenge of trying to uh, throw all this burden to our already overburdened workforce is too much. AIML is already giving insights as to the behavior and the pattern, the digital patterns of life and where they start to go wrong. And it forms that first predicate of put that talent, put that rare talent that we have uh, throughout law enforcement in the private companies as well, put them on it. Someone mentioned that companies can be, and customers can be affected for a long time without knowing. That speaks to the increasingly stealth nature of the attacks. Um, AIML will, on a cloud, gives you the ability in the back room to characterize the performance of individual customers on the cloud, the customers within the customer, the actors within the customer, and then do pattern recognition that says, something here does not look right. All the settings may be make, making these allowances, but these set of permissions have never happened before. This data has never been exfilled before. It's never moved this way. That has That's an AML challenge in a space that's just exploding in terms of uh, volume and veracity. Right. Thank you. Interesting. Um, I want to come back to one of our earlier themes. I was talking to both Brian and Chris about this earlier and saying that a few years ago, if I was advising a client on whether should, they should report to law enforcement, I would say, yes, you should. Uh, but don't get your hopes up that they're going to catch somebody in Russia uh, behind this attack. But I think that it's fair to say we've seen a lot of uh, really interesting success stories in the last couple of years. Uh, and, and, and my answers are different on that now. So I want to uh, give Eric and uh, sorry, uh, Brian and Chris a chance to brag a little bit here and tell us about uh, some of the successes that you've had working collaboratively with, uh, with the FBI and the RCMP, because I think that not enough people know about those. And I think that it would give people uh, maybe a different view towards reporting if they, if they knew about this. Ryan, oh, me, okay. Um, yeah, so um, great, great question. Um, you know, it, what we face is, is daunting out there, but you know, I'm glad we have the chance to share a little of the success stories. And really the only way we've succeeded on these has been a collaborative effort. Um, for example, there was a recent, uh, just before uh, the Christmas where the, where the FBI, the RCMP, involving the National Cybercrime Coordination Unit and the Ontario Provincial Police um, worked together over a couple of years uh, then it led to uh, an arrest of an individual uh, located here in the Ottawa region. And really, that, that only occurred by really um, folks working collaboratively together and figuring out uh, within their authorities and what they could share and the legal authorities of how to address this. And it was, it was a really, um, everyone checked their egos at the door. Um, there was no turf wars and it was really coming together. And, and you know, Brian and I have talked about this, like we, we need to do more of that and there's, there's scope to do that in the future. Um, the other is the importance of, of reporting up front is we've had some success and there, there was even one and I'll, I'll anonymize this a little bit. There was, there was one this past weekend where the US shared some information about they were seeing a ransomware attack kind of unfolding in real time where the, the victim was, was being attacked. And they were able to get that inf information to us on, was on a Friday night. Um, <laughs> and uh, us working with, with some local police were able to get in contact with the company um, over the weekend and say, look, we're, we're seeing this happen to your system right now. And you need to take some measures to, uh, to, to prevent this from, from the ransomware from actually taking place. Um, and, 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 and in many respects, that, that they, they were successful and they were able to prevent this. I, I, I put this out there as a lesson learned is that this is, you know, when we go back to the ambassador talking about, you know, being faster than the cyber criminals, we have to be able to do this at, at that kind of speed and at a bigger scale. And it involves both the partnerships, some of the technology underlying, and then the, the sort of the willingness of, of the victims or potential victims in the private sector to, to be part of that. So, you know, what I'd like to see very early on in, is that a victim really engaged law enforcement and Canadian Center for Cybersecurity right on, right at the outset. And then we've got the capability and the partnerships built in to prevent it, give them the, 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 the assistance they need, and, and then eventually down, down, the, down the line, get the information that comes back and then we go after the person who actually, or the group that actually did this. So, so um, yeah, that's just a sense of some of the success stories that we're having and, and where I think we need to go in this space. Great, thank you. To build upon what uh, Chris just mentioned, uh, Chris and I were very fortunate in that fortunate enough to be a part of that operation. 
uh, late last year where the OPP and the RCMP NC3 and the FBI were able to collaborate real time. And it was very interesting to see how the folks on the ground were able to make real time decisions based on the sharing of information and intelligence between the Canadian component and the American component and see the enrichment process go through. And while we started planning the operation about 60 days out, we went through about 30 iterations of the plan. And it, and it changed for the better every single time as we learned more and more about the actor and how the approach would benefit everybody. But one thing we also did learn is we're not gonna arrest our way out of this cyber problem. That's merely just one component. What we also did learn is while we were fast, flat, and flexible within that operation, we started to scrutinize the way we do business together systematically and how may we do this at scale, right? And, and one of the analogies we like to talk about is you know, what we're dealing with right now with, with COVID, right? What happens to the body when uh, you're infected? It identifies that there's a foreign entity in your body it addresses, it eliminates, but what does it do right after that? The body learns. It establishes antibodies, and then you have that cycle where it then pushes those antibodies so it is more resilient for it to get hit again. And I think that is something we need to look at from the cybersecurity angle. And to, to bring it down to a more actionable component is we need to be able to detect, address, eliminate, and learn, and that would mean from a cybersecurity sense that we need to be conducting intentional, prioritized cross-border engagement from a North American perspective with critical infrastructure that if they were to go down, it would impact both US and Canadian equities. And we would need to have those conversations about making it easier for CSOs and CISOs to report to one piece and it hits everybody. It hits the US and the Canadian components as well so that they can focus on getting their systems back online as well. And then we need to look harder at a common operating picture of what Conti or Lockbit and Ragnar Locker are actually doing, not just to US victims and Canadian victims, but from a North American perspective, how does that look like? And ultimately taking evidence and finding a way to transition it into intelligence. So it gets back into the bloodstream to develop those quote unquote antibodies and push it out to private sector. So while that is such a great win that we were able to conduct with the Canadians, it also opened up the aperture to do things much more on a strategic level left of intrusion and beyond the arrest as well. Thank you. Um, I want to take this back to a sort of a, a bit of a softball question, but I, I think your answers are going to be helpful for not so much the po folks in the room here today, but the people who may watch the recording of this who don't live with this day in and day out. Uh, so let's say that I'm a medium-sized uh, company, uh, and I've not experienced a ransomware attack before. I've heard of it, but that might be it. Uh, and I now discover something's wrong, and it appears that I've been the victim uh, of one of these attacks. I'll start with uh, with you two again, and then Eric and anyone else who wants to jump in on this. I'm curious to see if you have different answers. I suspect you won't. What do I do? What's first? What's second? What's the what's the process? Well, okay, I'll I'll, I'll start from maybe the law enforcement angle, where you know our preference would be. Uh, to engage your 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 local police or your police of jurisdiction. In some cases, that that is the RCMP in certain parts of Canada. Um, early on, and I, and I gave the example of um, while while the police aren't going to necessarily be able to give you the how to mitigate and get your systems back in line, they're going to be able to help with that the threat actor and and particularly related to to the uh, negotiation aspect. Um, probably I'll head over to Eric in, in a second, but you know, like if if that company has a a managed service provider that is doing some of their cyber cybersecurity aspects like that's obviously a um an important aspect um i'll i'll, I'll touch on we we don't recommend that victims pay um there is this is a challenging space and we do appreciate that that victims often feel like they don't they don't have a um they feel obligated just in the the corner they're painted into um but you know and, and you you talked about it in your opening remarks there uh, brent is that um, these are criminals. 
you can't trust them. Um, they there is no guarantee they're going to give you your data back, uh, not continue to to sell it or post it online, or to come back and victimize uh, you again. And we've seen evidence of that. And and even now we're seeing like where they come back a third time. Um, and so really. Um, you know, and then the other part is that it helps these groups get stronger and faster and nimbler when we're fueling them to do this again. So, um, again, we understand, but where we want to get into a space is that, that, that as many victims realize that, that they engage law enforcement early in the process. Um, and that, you know, in, in some cases, if we can move fast enough from the right setup, we can intervene. Um, we had we had another another successor, an example of the of kind of the same example I used before, where um we got some information from another a European bla- a European based um, uh, partner, um, and we contact the company who was in the midst of the negotiation. And in this case, we were actually able to see what data had been exfilled, and and convey that to the company. And that really influenced their approach with working with law enforcement <laughs> and the negotiations. And then we even took it a step further of, of working domestically here with agents with uh, agencies here. Um, and, and the European-based ones to get a um, the right legal tools in place where that server where that data was secure was being stored by the, that cybercrime group was was seized, and and so and, and working with the company. So so really, I'll just stress. There's another example of if, if that if that company had come to us right away and and we, we could put those pieces to to get together. Um, you know, we can we can make a difference of of what have you. I mean, we've got a lot of work to do on our front to get get to that. But that's that's what's in the yard of the uh, the possible. So um, maybe I'll, Brian can, or sorry, I'm going to turn it over to Eric here. Yeah. Before you do pick that up, it's not my job to do this, but just if I interject with one fact I found surprising from that TELUS report that dropped a couple of weeks ago was they discovered that the where companies actually did try to negotiate the ransom down, not just decide whether or not to pay or not pay, but when they tried to actually play hardball and negotiate the ransoms down, they may have got uh, the decryptors and they may have got assistance uh, in recovering their files. Statistically speaking, the ones who pressed harder for a better, better deal got less help from the threat actors and had less successful recovery of their data than the ones who just paid whatever they were asking for. Uh, And that's not a statistic I'd heard before. I don't know how new that information is or how surprising that is to you gentlemen, but it was a surprise to me and and frankly alarming. Sorry, over to you. Yeah, on on that point, it's it's, it's a business model for them. Uh, The more money they get, they provide a better service on recovery potentially. And if you get less money, they're gonna just uh, leave you aside. But I know, on on this incident, if you've got an incident in your organization, like often, uh, if the organization didn't have the time to um, prepare for these things, I think that, that the preparedness is, is very important, like where to call. You should certainly call enforcement, but also calling the cyber center is very important. We can provide a lot of advice and guidance. Uh, we have a mandate to uh, support the system of importance uh, of the government of Canada. So all the critical infrastructure sectors, so we can provide direct uh, incident recovery assistance, um, um, like forensics assistance and, and all that to uh, organizations. We can work with, uh, if they hire uh, IT specialists, security specialist companies to help them recover. So we can actually work with them as well. So we do that uh, on, on many occasions. Um, when organization is not prepared to do that, uh, often, uh, they are in a very difficult situation. Uh, if they didn't have the right backup, if the backup were also encrypted, for example, uh, they, they cannot recover their data. So at that point, it becomes sometimes, unfortunately, a business decision to maybe negotiate with the actor and, and do that. We don't recommend that. So right. that's why the outreach from the cyber center to, for, to increase the level of preparedness in the industry to, to make sure they have proper offline backups, they prepare, they do TTX, they know where they will have exercise, they know where to call, uh, also training program, and we have also on the cyber center a lot of training available for um, uh, for for government also in the critical sectors. Um, so the level of preparedness is, is uh, very important, this is what we want to stress. So uh, yeah, I'll leave. Uh, My last interjection on this point, for what it's worth, I had a case last year, I was dealing with a client with a breach, the breach was not publicly known, and we got a call from your center saying, so we heard you were breached, how can we help? Which was very impressive, a little spooky at the same time, but I have to say, they, 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 they were aware of it already. They were an excellent second set of eyes on the, on the recovery work that was being done, and so very impressive. Sorry, yeah, please. One quick yeah. Um, um, 
you know, interesting. In, in a couple of those incidents uh, I mentioned, one of the interesting things is, is often when when you know the RCMP reaches the contact, and, and good on good on the the victim for this, they often think it's a scam, um, and that but that just tells you a little bit of of how challenging it, it can be to to engage in this space. The one thing I'll mention about Eric uh, and 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 my organization working together is, um, you know, an in incident management. We really want to get to a space where whether they call the RCMP or the NC3 or the CCCS. It's sort of seamless behind the scenes that that the services that the victim needs can be provided, and even I, you know, I, I didn't mention before that we're uh, the National Cybercrime Coordination Unit will be moving into the same location as the Canadian Center for Cybersecurity. Um, so that's really going to set the foundation for um, for having the operational collaboration uh, that we need. So um, we see that that happening late spring or early summer, and um, really being another step forward to to work this problem. If the mics didn't pick it up, there were murmurs of approval in the crowd. So that's uh, you've you've got some fans on on that move. That's excellent. In, in discussions in this uh, recently in Washington, one of my colleagues who started one of the major private uh, intelligence firms and now has moved to a different position, their figures were seventy percent of the of the those hit try to pay, even when they have the insurance, which the insurance rates have gone through the roof, even when they have a backup. And the reason in trying to pull that apart was that the systems they had, their disaster recovery, their backup was not something that they felt they had sufficiently exercised to the point it's been being, and really exercised in a realistic scenario. Train like you will fight. And it is a fight when someone does this to you. It's a fight for your business. It's so good that you raise the issue of the small and middle layer because the large, large companies can absorb a hit. The small companies, we've seen it wipe some of them out. Um, sometimes they actually have a higher acumen for recovery. But in the medium, they do not, the answer to them of go hire uh, someone to, to allay your fear, uncertainty, and doubt, who will now bring in a, a contract of another thing you have to pay, that's not an option. It's not, it, and, it, and it, it is uh, often a false blanket of security. Uh, so what we found typically is it, on disaster recovery, probably not good to have the disaster recovery in the same set of servers that you have your main thing in, but, but that gets advised a lot. And I would offer that, and in consulting in this field, there were things companies could do at very low cost to significantly improve their cybersecurity posture in a short, short amount of time. For instance, how many privileged users do you have? What percentage of privileged users? Because it starts with stealing credentials. And the other thing I ask is, where's your CISO? Oh yes, we have a C-suite CISO and we have a CIO, where are they? Well, we're having a decision meeting here on mission. We'll talk to them later. It really, to me, the, the measure was the CISOs in those key meetings when you're launching a new product, having a major uh, uh, deliverable. And it, the companies that struggled most were the ones where they had the positions and they did not have them in the workflow for making those decisions on big investments. Absolutely. Actually, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, to to uh, add on to everybody else's, uh, I've been on the the receiving end of incidents where some victims have had no incident response plan. Some have had one and uh, they've haven't updated it in about five years, and they have and other organizations have a very comprehensive plan, but they've never practiced it. Right. So the the big recommendation from our side is that have an established, updated and practice plan and understand the working relationships amongst the non-technical and the technical components and the external partners that you're gonna be bringing in and understand their roles. It shouldn't be the first time when an incident occurs that your internal cybersecurity team reaches out to a third party cybersecurity team or understands or have, has read the insurance policy, et cetera. And defining the role ahead of time and hopefully already making pre-established contacts with law enforcement to know how they fit in and bake into the critical incident response plan. And those oftentimes lead to an environment that is much more suitable for crisis decision-making processes. And you can just see that the tenor of decision-making is much better when everyone already knows each other in the room. Absolutely. I'd like to take a step back, and um, and maybe we should have started with this, but uh, you've, there's a wealth of experience on this panel, and I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. 
How, I mean, we have a sense of where we are now. How much has changed in the last, let's say, 10 to 15 years? And I'm thinking here in particular about cyber threats uh, to critical infrastructure, since that's uh, top of mind for everyone right, uh, right now, with, especially with the, the conflict we're seeing and the threats that we're hearing coming out of that. Uh, I'd just be interested to know what changes you've observed and, and what you make of all this. And I'm happy for whoever wants it to go first. Maybe I can uh, start. Um, yeah. Um, well, a lot's changed, uh, especially in the critical infrastructure. So um, if you just go back about 10 years ago, none of those critical, a lot of the operational side of, of those critical, critical infrastructure was not connected to the internet. And you see now the convergence of OT and IT. And that is to facilitate um, operations and uh, from remote locations and just think examples of like nuclear plan or electrical grid management I used to have people with big levers and, and uh, old stuff from looks like from uh, an, another era. But now it's all with uh, you have network switch remote access and sometimes because the actual technology operating uh, those those facilities were not built with security in mind. You, you provide a connectivity that you can build to be secure, but sometimes if you have a vulnerability or an, a sophisticated actor that can come in or just uh, an happy clicker of an email and attachment that can put a malware on your uh, environment, uh, you give access to those facilities. And and in terms of like, we're talking about cyber, uh, cyber crime here. So because those critical infrastructure have money, they have capacity usually. So they will be prime target for uh, cyber criminals because well, those critical infrastructure must run. So there will be, um, they, this will probably facilitate the payment and large amount of payment. You saw the different uh, past incidents uh, related to that. There's also the risk of nation state prepositioning for for uh, advantage, sometimes just I think there will be the other panel will talk a little bit more about these things, but uh, it's it's a greater risk. It's it's a risk from OT IT conversions. There's also uh, supply chain is also a new risk in that space. So now you have IT service providers and uh, organizations that provide services to, for example, monitor, calibrate those uh, critical infrastructure services. So they will remote connect, and they do that for multiple. Uh, organizations. I think about uh, uh, electrical grid uh, distributor, generator and distributor, they may be using the same company calibrating some of their stuff on their infrastructure. So that could be, become a very interesting point of entry for an actor that now have access to a multitude of uh, organizations. So uh, the environment has changed a lot. It are, it's a multiplexity of, of like service provider products that can be uh, compromised uh, and from supply chain perspective you have to look at uh, who's providing those services who's the owner of those services what the affiliation they may have with criminals and all that so it's a it's a very complex uh, environment to 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 manage so a lot of changes in that space absolutely from a law enforcement perspective uh, the fbi traditionally in the past would be involved or get involved when an incident occurs, right? Boom, something happens. We try and reverse engineer what occurred. We gather enough evidence to present it in court. We try and go after the bad guy. We handcuff them. We high five. We call it a day, right? And, and that was the unsophisticated way we did it about two decades ago. And, and since then, we have evolved in, into a much more broader thought process where we wanted to look what we can do operationally left of the intrusion, right? And what we identified is that the cyber intrusion realm has been monetized. It's, it's a business now, but we call it intrusions as a service. We also like to call it the cyber counter proliferation area, right? Where, where other nations who may not have the, the capacity or the expertise from, from, the, from, the, uh, from the level of NSA and CSE, et cetera, they're able to actually procure that capability on their behalf to execute whatever it is they want to execute from a cyber perspective, right? And, and if, the goal is, if the goal isn't to arrest, but it's actually to um, uphold a safe and secure digital environment for everyone to operate, 
the goal is to reduce the amount of operation, uh, the, the amount of intrusions. So the focus is broadening within the Bureau, the USIC, and also our other federal law enforcement partners to frustrate the enemy so much that it makes them harder to conduct intrusions, to take away their tools, to take away their toys, to, to instill an aspect of distrust amongst that economy so that they focus on that and not focus on conducting intrusions against us. So, so there are multiple layers. And, and you, as you can see that uh, I just don't come from the cybersecurity space. I'm from the counterterrorism, counterintelligence, and, and drug trafficking space and arena as well. And, and a lot of these themes are now able to be carried over into this arena. So now we're applying some of those methodologies and thought processes as well. Right. So I'm, it's interesting, you mentioned big levers, um, old school. Uh, that's how Ukraine got their power plant back uh, when it was hit on this evening of December 23rd, losing power to 230,000 people attributed to Russia. The way they got the plant back online was they had the very crude Soviet era system in the back room and somebody still there who had been there a long time knew how to use it. Now it's not a backup plan you wanna depend on obviously. Um, so I, 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 I've been, a, Accused of being too optimistic, but I'm, I'm not gonna change. Um, <laughs> on power, we have an absolute obligation to this planet to change the way we generate power. Um, we have to go to clean energy. Uh, that is accelerating a digitization of a system across the board with smart inverters and lots of very low cost, low security devices that are IoT. That is the only way it's going to happen. So the, the challenge is that the footprint's much bigger. Someone mentioned OTIT chasm. That is a still in 10 years that has not closed. That is a cultural challenge as well. The OT uh, communities typically do not have the level of cooperation with the IT communities. So what's needed? Well, in today's world, uh, in the United States, there are 5,000 electricity providers. 5,000. 10,200 independent water and wastewater providers and a regulatory scheme that is very complex. So what has to happen is that this increasingly huge space that can do a lot for us to get us off of fossil fuels, which we must as a responsibility to the planet. At the same time, we have to be able to build a, digital, a situational awareness for digital, for those operating systems. That can only be done at a very large scale and AIML is gonna be a very big part of it. So there is not, we are not gonna make, those, I, those I, IoT devices are increasingly throwaway. They're not gonna have heavy layers of security. Uh, but so it's going to be a defense in depth that's created from a different type of monitoring and situational awareness that can not be done anywhere else except very large scale. So I'm, I'm very hopeful because the, the progress at least, and, and you know, take Colonial Nolamar. So Colonial, the OT side, the operational side, where we are seeing counterfeits and we're seeing equipment with extra features we didn't order <laughs> show up uh, from suppliers and, and realizing we need other suppliers. The United States doesn't make high power transformers anymore, by the way. We got out of that business. GE got out of it and uh, offshored it. So there's some issues there, but Colonial shut down and paid the ransom. Colonial got hit on the IT side said, we're not sure if it's gonna hit our OT side. They had a DMZ in the middle and said, let's proactively shut down. So twofer, they got a twofer on that one and they paid, yeah. okay? Olimar released lye into a water supply at levels that would have been dangerous. Um, different actor there, not a state, state actor. Um, and it was spotted by someone who had long-term watching and said, that's, that's not the reading the way it should be. So what we haven't seen is a campaign and critical infrastructure as part of a campaign. And what we're looking at Ukraine now is saying is that could be integrated into the military electronic order battle. So we have time in North America and we learned in the United States from the Texas incident, which was just a series of cascading failures and something called cold weather, which I think you folks know. <laughs> um, so we have, ice storms. We, yes, we have a really, period of time when we can address this before it becomes this apocalyptic like issue that I think is is preaching to fear and fear makes people paralyzed. And, and if there's nothing else you remember from today, it is the number one thing we have to avoid. We can make mistakes, but if we have to move at speed and we cannot move at speed if we're paralyzed.
Thank you. That's that's it's important to note. Thank you. On that point, uh, let's talk about empowering people. Let's talk about empowering states. Uh, so maybe we'll do a lightning round here. Um, and I'd like you to tell me what you would like to see in place. What tool would you like to have that you don't have now? Uh, and this could be anything from better public education to legislative changes. And I'm fine with you saying this is not my organization's the, uh, idea. This is just mine. Uh, we've seen in the states uh, some 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 tentative steps. We've seen um, a, a law that makes mandatory reporting for critical infrastructure if they pay a ransom uh, within 72 hours, I think. Uh, so that's a step. We've had discussions about the possibility of banning cryptocurrency, which I don't think we'll see. But what uh, what do you want? What would you like to see? Oh, am I going to go first? Oh, <laughs> the minute the minister's left, it's, it's too late for me to ask what I need. Um, yeah, no, um, I, I, I think, um, you know, and I want to jump on into Eric's domain too much, but I, I really think we need to do more about equipping individual Canadians, small and medium enterprises, um, all the way up the chain with, with the tools and the education that they need to either protect themselves um, and it can be even simple, like it doesn't just have to be provided by the government. It doesn't have to be provided by the private sector, but we need to make this, it could be public partner, pri uh, public private partnerships, but we need to make it easier for folks to do that. My, my 80 year old mother who knows what I, what I do. I often wonder when she calls me and says, you know, Hey, how, how come I'm getting this email or should I click on this? Um, and she, she knows what I do for a living. Uh, and I <laughs> talk to her regularly. Um, I often wonder how can we give her the better, not only the education, but the technical solutions so that she doesn't have to face that at her front, um, along with, with the small, medium businesses and all the way up, up the chain. So I, I think, I think, and there, I think there's lots, lots of opportunity to, to do that in this space. So maybe I'll just stop there. Nice. And maybe your mother and your grandmother and my mother should go out yes. for coffee and timbits because yes. I get those yes. calls too. Yeah. Um, no, there's, uh, there's a lot that we need. I think there's a lot of gap today. Um, in terms of technologies, like there's easy things that people can do to to benefit from some of the security stuff, even even free stuff. Like we have uh, worked with Sierra for the Canadian Shield. Uh, people can use it. I have it on my phone, my tablet at home. My mother's got it on her tablet. Uh, and um, so these are things to protect uh, going to maybe some malicious sites. Uh, they use commercial feeds. They use indicators that we provide to them that are not necessarily uh, commercially available. So uh, I think there's a lot of benefit there. Uh, we have, um, we're working with the industry to, um, to be more real time. So we're working with the electrical grid, like we just talked about that, to be, to be, for them to be able to implement on their defensive system indicators like machine to machine in real time, like we do internally in the government. So we work with, we have a project called Lighthouse, also, uh, uh, blue flames with the energy sector where they can benefit from those things. So we want to see that like this information is available. So they, they should be benefiting from, from that. Um, I think in terms of we talk about preparedness, I think we need, they need to be, uh, organization need to be more aware of what can happen. Um, in our engagement, we work directly with a lot of organizations. And I think we, we need also to work with uh, industry association, uh, regulators to help them set minimum bar in cybersecurity in, in like defense and also in detection like detecting things rapidly and take action is 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 critical um, we we often like if we just go back a few years back you had actors setting up on networks and be there dormant and snooping around you have that experience for days and months now we do forensics on incidents and the actor was there for three hours and a half. They go in, they snoop around, they capture the stuff, zip the stuff, get out. And if you don't have the right detection system and the right uh, uh, muscle exercise to respond to those things rapidly, um, it's too late. You, you, if you start thinking about it, it's already too late. It's gone, the data is gone and you, you need to, it's sometime, for some cases, it's very hard to recover. So. Um, on the reporting, great that you have that in the US. Um, I think we would look for the same thing in Canada. I think reporting uh, for us to gain the information, to understand almost in real time what's happening, uh, what are the threats that Canada is, is uh, again, uh, under, and to be able to inform uh, the industry of those change happen day to day, 
uh, it's it's we're, we're so blind to a lot of things uh, because we people don't report to us. So yeah, so that's something we that would uh, look for. Absolutely. Well, you mentioned phishing emails and family. Um, in my family, given what I did, my adult daughter says, "Dad, is this you?" Um, so <laughs> I test. Time. Yeah, but it, my 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 mine is pretty simple, and it applies to every citizen and and companies, no matter what. In the United States, we have a a terrible love of nostalgia for our old equipment and our old apps. We don't zero out our apps on the phone and load the latest version. And the app won't tell you when it's leaking like crazy. Mm. You do upgrade your phone. You, you get those updates, et cetera. But we look, I, I do random checks. How many apps do you have running? Oh, probably five or six. Try 17. Of uh, the 17 that you have running, how many have a new version that's secure because there's leaky apps? What's a leaky app? Well, we have that discussion. If it was free, it's probably worth what you paid for it. <laughs> okay, so so on an individual level, in companies, consulting companies and watching companies try and use infrastructure that they're very proud and doing amazing things to keep running. Actually, they, they just, since the late '90s, or laptops, anything more than 24 months, throw it in the wood chipper. Uh, I swear, it, there's there's no way to keep it secure. So the word nostalgia comes from the Greek word for nausea, and I think it, it, my advice is. Look, if you're a company or your organization or your individual, look for the older stuff. Uh, and in some cases, in most cases, of over 24 months, start to have a plan to retire. And be able. And I came from a thrifty upbringing uh, in a large family without a lot. And so we learned to make things like, nope, that's the wrong attitude. The, the ambassador said it well. Seven years in digital is 100 years in dog years. Two years in digital is 20 years in analog. Hmm. So I, I have a lot of nauseating things in my house. If, if I thought it's very hipsterish, San Francisco of me. I, <laughs> what what I would love to see within the cybersecurity space is uh, not not necessarily a tool, but everyone in the room, right? Mm. Everyone in the room sharing intelligence like it mattered that there's a human cost behind it, and not just from government to government, country to country, right? But also with private sector in the room as well. I, I do see, and having worked in DC and Los Angeles and, and abroad, and then also in Silicon Valley, that there's more than enough talent in tech to protect us. It's a matter of putting all those dots together in one space and connecting it all, right? And, and seeing if we can develop a nervous system where when something comes in, we get it to the right the right component or the right components right away, so we react. It's it's natural, right? Like a nervous system. Um, I, I've seen at very small scale in operations where where um, folks are are figuring it out at the edges, where where it's not necessarily a, a C two component, where it's command and control, but it's dispersed decision making across all equities because there's owned ownership, owned ownership. One of the things. Uh, if you put everyone in a room to include private sector is that it, you don't just put each other in there just to deconflict, but it's about converging ar around common goals, right? And objectives. And then being very honest with each other's agency's capabilities and incapabilities and being okay with asking for assistance to fill each other's gaps as well, right? So we can hand the ball back and forth. Where my policing jurisdiction in the US runs out, I have the ability to hand it to the RCMP or to Ontario Provincial Police. And when the journey takes us outward into other countries, we already have that scaffolding of sharing already built with other law enforcement and private sector partners, we, you know, with that common goal of protecting that digital infrastructure. Excellent, thank you. All very good points. Um, I hate to say it, we're at the end of our time, which means no sketch comedy, but we have finished with uh, a positive note and some very uh, constructive, concrete uh, ideas. So I want to thank you all for, for playing, and uh, uh, I hope you can stay the rest of the afternoon and enjoy the rest of the program. Thanks again. Uh, we are, please. <laughs> I understand we're going to take a 10 minute health break. So if folks want to get up and stretch, uh, we'll be back for let's say three o'clock and uh, looking forward to continuing the discussion. Thank you. Hello. Hi everybody. If I could ask you just to, uh, to take your seats. Thank you so much. Um, 
I want to make sure that you're able to get out of here while there's still daylight. Uh, and I want to make sure that we all have time for, for, this, for this panel as well. So we had a light, frothy discussion about ransomware. Uh, and now we're going to lighten the mood with the talk on cyber warfare. Uh, it, obviously a very serious subject, and it's, it's tragically so. And I mean, I've been trying to write an article about this for three weeks, and it never finishes because every day something new, some new aspect uh, comes out of it. And it's just it's so much to keep track of. Uh, so I'm very grateful to have another uh, incredibly accomplished panel with us here today. Uh, for Just for the folks in, in the audience who don't know who you are, maybe I can ask you to put your, your hands up as I go through. Uh, I have Sean M., who's uh, Director General, Cyber Operations Division at CSIS. Thank you. Steve Waterhouse is the Assistant Deputy Minister of the Ministère de la Cybersécurité et de Numérique uh, of the Government of Quebec. Bonnie Butlin is the co-founder and executive director of Security Partners Forum. And the Right Honorable uh, Yasser Nakvi is uh, here uh, and he's a member of parliament from Ottawa Centre. Thank you all for joining us. Um, and as before, uh, I'll direct some questions to people, but please feel free to jump in uh, wherever you have anything to say. It's, it's, it's most useful to us as a dialogue, so we appreciate your, your, your insights. Um, that said, I'm gonna start with you, Steve. Maybe you can sort of paint a picture for us of how the cyber landscape has changed uh, with the Ukraine conflict. All right, that's a big question to start with. Absolutely. Um, how much time do I have? Um, <laughs> maybe an hour. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, um, but on that question, I have to go back to my former life as a uh, military uh, infantryman and started off uh, working off with rifles, I mean, digging trenches and so on. And now we, we're seeing the same opportunity happening as a cybersecurity specialist doing it, but on the cyber world. What I mean by that is I want to compare that uh, when you prepare for a uh, position, uh, defensive position, uh, you make sure that uh, you're ready to uh, face the, uh, the enemy and so what ever matter. In the IT world, what I've learned over the years, you have to do the same. And it's not very different. And then when you, uh, first of all, you have to know about what's your enemy, where he's at, how he's operating and so on. Because if you, it's one, this is one of Sun Tzu's teachings. Eh? Um, once you know your enemy and you know yourself, you'll be able to fight anyone and win any war. But if you don't know yourself, you don't know the enemy, that's bad. And that goes and translates also in the uh, IT world because if you don't know what your assets are, what are your assets are, who's working with, who's trained and so on, uh, they're gonna beat you every time. And just like we said on the first panel, uh, everybody said on the first panel is that uh, it's 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 a coming back effort. I mean, everybody's uh, getting reinfected because they don't learn from their first mistakes, if we can call them mistakes. Maybe just a, a threat, just re-emerging, re rewritten. Um, this goes all over the place. So what we've learned in Ukraine is that what's happening there, uh, although the uh, the population, well, it's a. Uh, it's, an, it's, a, it's a population as, as well as we are, I mean, educated, I mean, well-structured and so on. But last week, uh, if not in the beginning of the week, I was seeing a, uh, an IT technician just refitting, reconnecting fiber optic because they got hit by a bomb blast. So life goes on like that, as well as the uh, um, transformation and numeric uh, minister over there that called up Elon Musk had to have Starlink's dishes to have the internet, keep it flowing so they can everybody talk together and especially report back to the, to the rest of the world what is happening over there. So telecom, so communications is foremost important. And again, especially in a theater of operation and theater of war, most definitely they have to keep that data flowing that the information has to go back and forth. Um, we've seen that. And at the same time, as we've illustrated on the first panel, the threats are still upcoming and the association of the criminal world with the uh, nation states, as probably you can testify to that, is also a new uh, definition of how they can just work together for um, unfortunately the wrong reasons. Absolutely. And it's difficult to tease apart how much of this is, uh, and, and maybe the distinctions are coming to the point where they don't matter anymore, uh, but it's difficult to tease out how much of this is actually state uh, cyber, uh, cyber activity, how much of this is uh, criminals sort of operating uh, under a regime of benign neglect, uh, how much of this is hacktivism. Uh, maybe I can ask you, Sean, do we have a sense of uh, whether the Russian state, uh, what the extent to which actual Russian state actors, if you can draw a box around what those actually are now, have increased cyber threats or cyber attacks to Western allies? Yeah, sure. That's a good question, especially in this time. And I, I think before that, I just go back and baseline kind of what the nature of a cyber attack can be when it's a state-sponsored cyber attack. Um, so 
former infantryman as well, so I'm going to quote Clausewitz rather than Sun Xu. But <laughs> Clausewitz had uh, had indicated that war is a continuation of politics by other means. So is cyber attacks. You know that is what a cyber attack is. And why would a country conduct cyber attacks, right? And there's, to my mind, kind of four main reasons why they do that. One is a straight espionage play, which is to learn the secrets, the states that a country wants to have. Doesn't mean military, political, economic, or whatever. So in the context of what's going on right now, one could clearly infer that, that the Russian government would be very interested in what NATO governments are going to do in response to the situation in, in, in the Ukraine, or in Ukraine, pardon me. So that's kind of one nature of cyber attack. Another one, which is pervasive, is, is the theft of intellectual property. And we see billions of dollars being stolen. Uh, and those, these are public dollars and private dollars as companies and governments invest in anything. Right? And we saw, um, you know, over the last couple of years, a lot of money being stolen from COVID research and things like that, where, you know, money had been invested and, and was stolen by our adversaries. A third thing that they can do to attack is to collect personal information. And we see some foreign governments are going to great lengths to collect an incredible amount of personal information on millions and millions of citizens. In 2020, uh, it came out, it was reported that the uh, Shenzhen Genoa data company in China had files on 2.4 million people, including 16,000 Canadians. And these were Canadians that you wouldn't necessarily expect. They had Prime Minister Trudeau's 11-year-old daughter, they had a file on her, uh, that they had collected this information on. Why are they doing this? And, and there's a reason for that. And then the final reason is, um, to go back to a military thing, in many ways, cyber attacks are the 21st century equivalent of strategic bombing. You can denigrate a country's ability to fight a war or to maintain foreign policy by attacking that. So why would you bomb the electrical grid if you can just take it offline? Right? So these are the four kind of things that, to my mind, that cyber attacks can do. Now, in the context of the, of the war right now, we thus far haven't seen a lot of that happening to Canada, not at, a, at, a, at a, an accelerated rate. It, it's frankly always happening to us, mm. but we haven't seen that spike in attacks that perhaps we thought of. Although Ambassador Cohen in his opening remarks certainly pointed out that the warning has been issued and it is, you know, just as Russia has pointed out, we have nuclear weapons. They have also pointed out, we have cyber warriors. So there's a bit of a, a, a warning issue there. I'm not terribly surprised that this hasn't happened yet um, for a couple of reasons. One is I think at the first off, it is escalatory. A state on state attack like that or an attack that brought down, you know, a Canadian power grid or a Canadian uh, critical infrastructure like that. That's changing the nature of the conflict with NATO. Right. And I think everybody is very cautious right now. Let's not get let's this is dangerous water. Right. We are. I don't want to say we're on the threshold of World War Three, but. I think a lot of intelligent people have suggested that this is probably the most dangerous it's been in 50 years. And, and you know, as a student of international relations, I would say it's the most dangerous we've been since the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, which was 1962. Um, so nobody wants to, to exacerbate things. Um, the other reason I don't think it's happened is, is I think that, you know, the Russians are currently occupied with, with Ukraine. And to their credit, the Ukrainians have been really, really good at fighting off some of these cyber attacks. And to your point, Steve, the Ukrainian infrastructure has been very resilient. And, and, you know, so I think one thing we've learned from this is maybe when you look at a hybrid cyber kinetic war, it might not be as easy as we thought it was going to be, uh, particularly when you're, when you're fighting against a technologically um, advanced or adept opponent. And then finally, and this is just my personal opinion, but, but I do see, you know, we've seen in, the, in Ukraine you know, a highly mobilized, motivated group of, of Ukrainians can can outfight a, a group of demoralized Russians who are maybe not invested in it. And um, I would speculate and we see uh, lots and lots of Russian IT professionals leaving Russia, going to Tbilisi, Erevan, Turkey and that. Um, it's entirely possible that some people's hearts just aren't in the fight, just as we see conscript infantrymen walking away from the battlefield, puncturing their gas tanks, puncturing their tires, and walking away. Um, I would speculate that there's probably a bit of that going on too. All that said though, to Ambassador Cohen's point, the nukes are still out there, um, as are the cyber warriors. Um, so we haven't seen it yet, but I, I wouldn't say that we're out of the woods. Right. And I, I've heard at least, I mean, there's been all kinds of speculation on why have we not seen more obvious attacks? I mean, one of the theories that I heard was, and I think this is what you're getting at, uh, Pre President Putin is worried that this would invoke uh, an obligation on NATO to respond in a military way. 
I don't have a sense of whether that's a, a, a naive view or whether that sounds probable to you. I, I think NATO, uh, a couple of, couple of days ago, a NATO uh, representative suggested that a sustained coordinated cyber attack on a NATO partner could conceivably be deemed to be an attack. Right. Um, but ultimately, it's a political response as to whether or not, you know, NATO invokes Article 5 and not to pass the buck, but there's a politician right beside me. <laughs> 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 Any thoughts on that? Well, the Prime Minister is in Brussels right now. <laughs> At the NATO Fair. summit. Um, well, um, I, I want to agree with, 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 with Sean. I, I, I think this is, this is a real issue for NATO that they would have to explore. Um, as early as last year in 2021, they said, they said that they would look at a cyber attack on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis. This this situation in 2022 is is real, and I'm 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 sure that they will look at what scope of of a cyber uh, offensive may qualify if it does qualify under Article Article Five. But I think that speaks to a broader issue that, as as being mentioned by our friends, that the nature of warfare has changed. Right, that the war is not only just taking place right now in Ukraine, it actually could have a direct impact on us without any army or missiles being fired uh, at us. And that's, I think, from my perspective, that's the point that we need to be really mindful of, that even though it's been quite quiet uh, up to this point, um, contrary to what we may have expected, we cannot be complacent, that we need to continue. And I, I speak from a, as a politician whose job is to look at public policy and resources and make sure the legislative tools are there for our, for our experts to do the things that we need to make sure that the the resiliency in the system, the resources that's needed, uh, the tools that are required are, are well are well resourced, are available so that uh, that we are keeping up to times, we are keeping up to speeds, that we do not let our critical infrastructure, that we no, do not let our 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 businesses uh, uh, be in the line of fire. And I think that's that's the most important thing and. There has been a lot being done, but continuously we need to continue to evaluate uh, whether things that we have to, done up to now is sufficient um, as the technology moves forward uh, and how do we keep pace with it. Absolutely. And I think it's probably worth noting with some of these attacks, it's hard to know exactly where they fall within that spectrum. I mean, it would have been easy for people to miss this with all the other things in the news, but there was a, uh, after Conti had said they were going to attack anyone who attacks Russia, Conti attacked a smelting operation in Quebec. Now, they didn't tell us whether that was for fun or for profit, but we know that you know, the timing seems awfully coincidental, so it's hard to know where that falls in. Is this something that we respond to or not? Uh, you touched a bit on this, and I'd like to, to throw it over to Bonnie to talk about this because I mean, you, you, you are a student of the, the geopolitical situation. How likely is spillover from this war and what could that look like? Thank you. And just a quick caveat, I'm, I'm going to be speaking at my own personal opinions, thoughts, comments, questions, and not specifically for the Security Partners Forum today. Sure. Um, I think the spillover effect is, is quite likely. I agree with Sean. We are in the worst situation we've been in in at least 50 years. I think um, as we're struggling to figure out what's going on with the cyber um, attacks or the cyber front altogether, I think uh, we're facing something a little different than we have now. I'm not military, but my background is in military doctrine strategy and, and geostrategic um, matters. And I think what we're seeing here, and I don't say this at all lightly, is a new form of warfare. And I think it's not quite hybrid warfare uh, in terms of cyber. I think we're seeing something a little bit different that's driving up between cyber warfare, cyber law, and on the other side, sanctions and economic law. And both cyber law and economic law are very ill-defined. They don't have their own uh, status. And what we're seeing driving up in the middle of all of this is fintech warfare. Mm. And that's where I think we're going to really see the blowback because fintech warfare, um, which, is, which is not kinetic, but it, it can with supply chain and leading into cyber uh, effects and what we're seeing happening in Russia right now, it is all out warfare. We're looking at zero casualties for the West, but we're looking at, as um, the Honorable Minister Melanie Jolie said, suffocating Russia. And when you're trying to suffocate a country, it's like cancel culture and it, it's involving social media and it's involving the private sector in a way and therefore civilians. Civilians are attacking a state 
that's where I think we may see the blowback onto our own country and our own civilians in very unexpected ways. So it's a, a new form of warfare that um, I think has not been defined yet, but it is uh, both zero casualty, zero casualty tolerances and acceptances. And yet on the other end of that, we're looking at increasing risk of nuclear warfare and hypersonic missiles and very serious cyber attacks into our domestic space and against civilians. So we're in a very, very different territory now and um, escalatory for sure. And uh, it's hard to switch it off once it starts because so much of it is social media and public campaign. Uh, just one quick last thought on that. Uh, Russian cats have been banned from the international cat shows. Um, this is how far and uncontrolled and organized this kind of warfare can go. So uh, very dangerous indeed. So I have a Russian blue uh, cat. Should I be Beautiful. worried? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's uh, frankly terrifying, but but illuminating. Um, and I want to take it back to our member of parliament. You talked a bit about resilience, but as we talked a lot about on the first panel, uh, a response, uh, well, cybersecurity, uh, the cybersecurity ecosystem isn't just state and state and law enforcement. It's, it's mostly uh, private. So what would you hope to see? What do you think we need in terms of uh, government and private sector working together to combat this new kind of threat? Well, I, 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 the 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 first part of the first panel was very illuminating in terms of what needs to happen. I think it, it showed uh, the whole notion around that there needs to be still be more education, that there is still uh, a fair bit of um, shared responsibility, if I can say this, where one not only have to inform themselves but take steps necessary to protect uh, themselves. Um, this is this is where I, I personally worry. Um, where that our our mid to small size businesses are quite exposed, they don't, as you were saying, they don't understand the nature of the threat, and how uh, they could be duped. Uh, we have individuals who are who are exposed. We all talk stories about our mothers and grandmothers. Uh, you know, we all have that, and we. All, I just learned about a, a friend told me that whose father just lost six thousand dollars within a few hours because he clicked something on the phone and he thought he was helping a bank. Um, smart guy, very educated guy, worked in in um, in government before, but uh, got succumbed uh, to the temptation of of uh, the narrative that was being presented uh, to him. So I think there's there's fair bit of work that needs to that needs to happen. In my previous life, I was uh, at the provincial government and and served as both attorney general and solicitor general, and you saw that kind of thing happen all the time and law enforcement tools as much as they're important they are all happening after the fact right and i think that was that point was made. prevention is the key we need to get ahead of it we need to make sure that the tools are available to our private sector uh to our critical infrastructure providers because that can have a huge huge impact on uh, on the entire system I'll tell you one area of vulnerability that I feel is our small municipalities across the country. Right. They don't have the tools, nor the resources, nor probably the awareness at this point uh, to take all the necessary steps to protect themselves. So I feel that there's much work needs to happen um, within the, speaking within the Canadian context, where federal, provincial, municipal levels of government working together to ensure that we've got a, a good, strong safety network available uh, to protect our small and medium-sized businesses, but other um, para public and para-public uh, organizations as well that hold a lot of information, a lot of data, and there's a fair bit of money involved as well. Absolutely. And it occurs to me that this is probably the first time since most of our grandparents that um, we were been in a situation where individual Canadians are part of the war effort or need to be just in terms of their awareness and their sophistication and their vigilance, uh, because they're the ones clicking on these emails. They're the ones that are going to be targeted and, and they're, they're, they're the, the entry in for these, uh, for these organizations. Sorry, go ahead. Thank you. I'd like to add to that that the, um, we're a few government entities, governance across the world that started up uh, bringing the topic of cybersecurity to the executive level. Mm -hmm. You have the uh, Directorate of Cybersecurity in Israel that stood up officially in January of 2020, if I remember correctly. Uh, you have now the Office of Cybersecurity at the White House as of October. And now you have in Quebec the Cybersecurity Ministry that uh, for the whole province looks up 
to municipalities, to the SMBs, and to bring to the population a support, which not, not to go to a, in competition with the cybersecurity center, not whatsoever, but we're gonna complete the reach out to the population because this, this is the idea, this is the, the thinking, the forward thinking of uh, Minister Kerr who brought it up and they enacted this ministry, which I'm proud to be part of now. But uh, to that effect is really to um, make uh, the um, SMBs, even large enterprises, uh, realize that now the topic of cybersecurity does not have to be a fourth or fifth uh, hat of responsibility to the IT guy somewhere, but has to be at the executive level to take the immediate decisions when something hits the fan. Right, right. Um, I want to come back to a, a part of the discussion we were dealing with before, and I'm going to come back to you, uh, Sean, on this. Uh, again, it's hard to know with just what the publicly, the public facing things that we see uh, exactly what's going on, what attacks are happening, what attacks have anything to do with this war. Uh, is there anything you can tell us about whether there are certain regions or, or countries that are being targeted? Are there particular industry sectors that need to be worried about this? I think it depends on who's doing the targeting. So. Mm -hmm. As we've spoken around the table today, um, you know, there's state actors and there's non-state actors, and and uh, although there's a degree of overlap there, there's also a degree of autonomy between them. So, you know, state actors use cyber means as a, as a tool in their intelligence toolbox, just as they would use human intelligence or other sorts of intelligence. And um, what we see traditionally is is that those are state-driven things, driven by the intelligence requirements of their government. So. At the beginning of the COVID crisis, it was it was obvious that Canada was under attack, and it's in our public report, our our, our CSIS annual report, that that Russian cyber actors were attacking Canadian biomedical researchers for information on on the COVID vaccine, because that's what they needed to know about right then. And as I said before, now they're probably interested in in what persons such as yourself are thinking. What can Canada do at the governmental level with regards to NATO and Ukraine? That's a, that's a logical intelligence requirement. State level actors are a little bit more com or non state actors are a little bit more complex, uh, more complex because there is that. Is it for profit or is it for to cause trouble? Um, we do see a high degree of, of ransomware in, the, in in Russia. Right, there was a, a report came out from Chain Analysis a couple of weeks ago saying that seventy four percent of all ransomware dollars went back to Russia. So that's where a lot of those actors are. Um, so. The degree to which those entities are acting on behalf of the Russian state or not is, mm. is frankly a little gray. And, and, you know, so again, when you see somebody like Conti say, hey, if you're at war with Russia, you're at war with us, you know, was it coincidental or was it directed or was it simply something that they were doing as, as good Russian citizens would do? Right. And, and that goes to the third thing, which is what, what the Russians call, call patriotic hackers. Right? Just kids in their basement putting rounds down range on the West because, well, that's what I can do. And, and we saw the, the reverse of that where Anonymous had kind of come out and said, OK, Russia, if you're going to do this to Ukraine, then you've got a problem with Anonymous. Right. So it works both ways. Um, so all that to say, there's a lot of space there where attacks can happen. And I wouldn't put a lot of effort. I, I wouldn't put a lot of thought into the prioritizations because the prioritizations will move around very, mm -hmm. very quickly. Right now, I can divine where the Russian state is looking for intelligence, um, but that will change too, and that will evolve very, very quickly. So. Right. You touched a bit on this, and um, again, for those that were focused on the kinetic war, one of the interesting developments in the last two weeks that stopped me from finishing this article has been this activity with Anonymous, where you have them, first of all, attacking, attacking Russian critical infrastructure, working at um, you know, guerrilla uh, campaigns to get messages through uh, Russian disinformation to actual citizens, but on the more aggressive side, targeting companies uh, that didn't react immediately to a threat to withdraw from Russia within 48 hours. And we saw in the last 24 hours, uh, some of those companies are now doing it. It's hard to know if that's in response or if that was always their intention, but the timing is, the timing is what it is. So we have hacktivists uh, working, you know, deciding whether they're going to attack Russia or attack Western companies and then going ahead and doing it. You have uh, cyber criminals who are, again, it's hard to know, as you say, whether they're, whether to the extent to which they're tied to the government or just patriotic. So as a group of people whose job it is to make us safe, 
how do you feel about all this? Um, what do, I mean, what do we even do with this? I, I can tell you, I, I tried looking this up in the, in the talent manual to sort of, do, which describes, you're laughing because you know where I'm going with this. Uh, it sort of describes and, and categorizes, you know, who is what in, 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 uh, in, in sort of the law of war and where cyber warfare falls into that. These are actors that don't have defined roles. I'd like to take a Please. shot at that one. I think the answer is we don't know. The order of battle is not clear, even on the Russian side, even on the Canadian side, for example, who really is making the battle plans? Or is this, um, as again, um, Minister Jolie said, this is more of a movement, a movement of the public, a movement of getting um, uh, Canadians on board with this. But once you go in that direction, and, uh, and and unless I've missed something in between, Ukraine has not declared war yet. In fact, nobody's really declared war yet, but we seem to be at war. Mm. And when you're attacking an entire country, it, it's not even just the traditional cyber actors, I would argue now, whether it's state or non-state. Now, if you're crushing an economy, um, and, and I'm just gonna run quickly down the FinTech for those aren't, aren't familiar with it, blockchain, payment, exchange, research, digital money, online banking, investment and savings, crowdfunding, insurance, lending, machine learning, and, and trading. This will crush your economy and you will have supply chain effects as Russia is seeing. They're going to lose about half of their air alliance. Um, their aircraft is leased predominantly, and those aircraft are going to be, have to return to Ireland very shortly. Um, they're losing their car parts. They're losing chips. They're losing all kinds of supply chain, which will, while not a cyber attack, will take the guts out of their systems, their HR. Microsoft is pulling out, at least in part, um, all their payment systems, MasterCard, Visa. Your systems will start collapsing as if it was a critical infrastructure attack or a very severe cyber attack. And so, but who's in control of it? Anonymous, exactly. Um, you don't control anonymous and you can't call them off once they've started. And so there is there is no way to control this kind of war, but it will almost certainly be escalatory and um, not necessarily symmetrically escalatory. Um, unlike incremental sanctions, and th this is where this is very different than previously, incremental sanctions, you might get um, similar sanctions or um, some kind of tie to what you're doing. But when you're attacking an entire country, you may create enemies you didn't know you had that weren't hackers before, that weren't state hackers before. You may have a company so upset of the destruction of their supply chains or their ability to function, you may create enemies you never even thought you had. Hmm. I was afraid you were going to say that. Uh, does someone else want to weigh on on this? It's a big question, and, and, and we hadn't mentioned this, but part of this 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 mix uh, was uh, Ukraine calling for an IT army to respond on its behalf, and, and seemingly that's been happening. Good. Well, uh, it's, to some efforts, uh, you, you can uh, look at the uh, the call for help because they're desperate. I mean, they're looking for anybody who can uh, put the pitch in and uh, help out to, uh, again, sustain the infrastructure, telecom infrastructure, and IT, and so on. But again, uh, bringing on, uh, well, they invited themselves anonymous and these socially uh, enabled uh, uh, IT actors. And as we've seen in the past, well, let's put it at 20 years, uh, just for the sake of it, uh, we've seen these kind of uh, 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 social uh, social hackers coming in, uh, doing a, so a mission, uh, especially dedicated operations whatsoever. And then they retracted, you don't know when, you don't know why, they don't know where they are, where they went. Uh, so for the moment, they're going on with the wind that blows in the right direction. I mean, from our perspective. So let's say tomorrow morning, somebody has in their form the idea of just reversing this and say, well, we're just going to go and do something else somewhere else because now this we've done, we've committed to so much amount of time. Let's do something else more challenging and so on. And we've seen this in the past. So that's why we cannot rely, uh, we as a uh, society, uh, on these kind of resources to call upon them to help us out because they do what just they feel they want to do. Uh, the next morning they'll do whatever they want. And so on, uh, The as every uh, we've seen also uh, physical combatants, I mean, uh, being recruited by the uh, Ukrainian government, going over there, taking up arms and helping out, just as we've seen in other parts of the world in the last years. So yes, it is uh, something to see that, uh, yeah, everybody's helping each other, but to what extent uh, will this be continuing in the long run? I mean, physical people, I mean, it's, it's easy to document, it's easy to track, 
uh, to a certain extent. But in the cyber world, uh, until the telco lines are up, yeah, they'll be around for sure. Um, positively and on the other side also. So as we mentioned earlier, uh, Russia has a, a lot of resources scattered all across the world and they're ready to enact. And as you saw, as you said, Sean, we haven't seen the biggest part of the, that show, sorry to call it a show, but we haven't seen their, um, they're, they're doing their professional hacker, dedicated also cyber operations happening against us or against our economy. So as Bonnie said, we're pretty much uh, in the waiting to see something bigger happen, uh, not just from the cyber criminal gangs also. Right. I'll just add to that. Please. Uh, just to add to the happiness of what we're talking about here. <laughs> I imagine Bonnie and I get together and have a good time too, right? But, um, <laughs> you know, a wounded animal is a dangerous thing. And, and yeah. Russia's a wounded animal right now. And, and the more it gets backed into a corner, the more dangerous it gets. It's not, it's, it's not like we're going to declare victory and walk away from this. So, um, you know, Russian military doctrine is very, very clear that they will use nuclear weapons if they think there's an existential threat to the survival of the nation. And we need to very closely monitor the degree to which they feel that because it's not a one-way game here. It's like we're at the mercy of their assessments of the situation as well. And if they deem that they're under an attack that they cannot win, which is probably why they went into this in the first place, um, then, then we find ourselves in uncharted territory. If anyone would like to take now as an opportunity to move to the basement, um, <laughs> no one will hold it against you. Uh, it's certainly possible. Uh, does anyone else want to weigh in on that? I can say, I would say, do you have any, any anything you want to... No. <laughs> I, I, I was at a, a conference a couple of weeks ago where the question put to one of the panels was, uh, would a, uh, and this has been something that people have been talking about for five years, do we need a, um, cyber, a, a Geneva Convention for Cyber Warfare? And I'm not sure how meaningful and uh, meaningful that even is in, in, a, in a, a conflict as multifaceted as this one has become. Yeah, I'd, I'd take that one. Um, we already have a problem with cyber warfare in that different countries are treating it under different um, legal regimes. Mm. Um, some are treating it under international humanitarian law, uh, or laws of warfare. Some are treating it under human rights. Some are treating it under international law. China, I would argue, is treating it under international investment law. But now if we're mm. looking at the current situation where we're dealing more in economic law and um, sanctions on steroids and um, also a, a shift in, in how we're approaching it militarily, which is a huge departure from what we've done before. Um, if you think of uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, the efforts taken to avoid civilian casualties was intensive and, and diligent, um, as opposed to what we're seeing here where the sanctions are intentioned against civilians and the blowback will likely come against civilians. Um, also, we're, we're seeing a, a, a morphing of different strategies like um, whole of government to whole of society uh, with um, across government or even into the private sector. I would say here as well, we're dealing with whole of society on steroids as well, where it's gone into the Twitter sphere and um, different companies or, or non-state actors involved as well. And so to, to come up with a, a Geneva Convention of some kind of, um, some kind of um, imposition of order upon this um, is going to be nearly impossible, particularly if we've moved into this fintech space up the middle. Uh, it's adapting faster than we can adapt to the cyber warfare. And then the, that's the last point, the understanding it's, it, varies among countries and among regions as well, where Russia has a different interpretation under international law. Um, they, as I understand, they had a uh, legal assessment before they invaded the Crimea, and they had a legal assessment in their favor before they moved into Ukraine as well. And so their interpretations, their um, legal histories are very different than ours, all within the same international order. So I, I'm not Again, some people call me glass two thirds empty, um, <laughs> and, and not inaccurately. Um, but I, I think there, that's not going to be the solution. I think uh, we we've radically departed from our way of warfare, where we're now focusing on civilians and civilian activity, as opposed to protecting and and working with civilians or protecting civilians. 
and moved to that zero casualty. And, and you know, even Kissinger himself talked about this uh, absolute security for one side, which would be zero casualties, um, is, is absolute insecurity for everybody else. And I think we're going to see that in the cyber realm on the other side of this. It's very difficult to control. Please. If I may just add a point, I mean, I don't know the answer to the question you're asking, but there's some fundamentals we have to be aware of. One, laws are only as good as pe people who decide to follow the laws. I mean, we have laws around not invading sovereign countries unprovoked. Right. There's an international treaty. All countries are signatory to it. We're witnessing it. First time in a long time, but it's happening. Um, and there will always be some actors who will not follow the laws that the capacity to then enforce the law. Right. So, so we have to be mindful. And in this case, as we're hearing from our panels, both this one and the one before, is that you've got a lot of non-state actors with nefarious purposes out there, uh, whether it's to collect your personal information, whether it's just get money, whether it's just to make a point uh, because they're uh, activists, whatever the case may be, um, to what extent having a, some sort of an international convention on cyber war or, or cyber security could, could uh, be enforceable against them is a big, big question mark. So I think I think the onus is still very much first on individual countries like Canada to make sure that we're doing everything in our capacity to build the resiliency in the system to be able to have, to in, to be able to ensure that we have uh, uh, as many defenses as possible to protect our critical infrastructure to protect our our people and our private sector. Um, once that is accomplished, I think then we obviously have conversations with like-minded uh, countries. We, we started this conversation talking about NATO and NATO's posture uh, in this particular issue. I think it will, it will be telling. And if NATO as an alliance says, we're going to look at, look at cyber warfare in the context of a treaty that was written in the, in the old style, a traditional warfare, and if they say this actually applies to cyber warfare as well, I think you've got some clues as to where countries as a collective or like-minded allied countries as a collective are now thinking where they can take this uh, cyber warfare and how to treat it in the future. Absolutely. Now we talked about a few of the themes here just to tie together. We talked about uh, sort of response and, and, and how to protect against all this. And we talked about you know possible blowback from the sanctions. One thing that we haven't touched on yet is the fact, and I know everyone in this room knows this, but I suspect some people watching this as a webinar may not, that, they were, that Canada actually has offensive cyber capabilities. Uh, and I'm going to read this because Sean made sure that I had I had this correct. Uh, there's a section of the CSIS Act 12.1 that permits the organization to take steps to reduce threats to the security of Canada. We also know that uh, CSC admitted in December 20, uh, 2021 that it has been using its cyber capabilities to uh, quote impose costs uh, end quote on foreign cyber criminals. Uh, do we worry about? Should we worry about how? that ability is being perceived on the other side of this conflict? Uh, do we think they're assuming that we're exercising? I'm not, notice I'm not asking if we are exercising those powers, but uh, do we worry that they are assuming we are or that we might? And do we think that that's going to inform the way that they approach uh, this war and, uh, and who they decide to involve in it? I have a yes. Anyone up here have a view? I don't think anybody should be surprised because, uh, you know, Canada's tool sets are, are grounded in legislation which is publicly available. So section 19 of the CSE or the CSE Act, pardon me, gives CSE the authority to conduct active cyber operations and it actually lists out some examples of what that might be. Um, and section, as you said, section 12.1 of the CSE Act gives CSE the authority to reduce threats to the security of Canada. So I don't think anybody should be particularly surprised by that. Um, I spent eight years in our international region and, and a fair amount of time outside of this country. I, I think most countries assume you know, Canada is a G8 country or a G7 country, and it's it's a modern developed country. I think it's an assumption that we use all the tools of statecraft that are available to us. And and clearly, what we see in this context is we are providing lethal aid to the Ukrainian military. We are providing, as Bonnie's alluded to, unprecedented sanctions. Um, so why anybody would suddenly be surprised that we may or may not be using cyber tools, I, I'm not sure why people would. I, I suspect sometimes the Canadian media and the Canadian population may be surprised by that. Um, 
but even there, it's like, well, it's okay to provide Carl Gustafs at M72s, but but to not use CSE's legislation, I, I don't, you know, that's a public policy discussion maybe, but I don't see why anybody should be surprised by Canada using all the tools in its toolbox. Okay, so this is already built into the calculus for Russia or, or any other country that we're dealing with on the other side of this? I would certainly hope so. <laughs> if not, we need better advertising. Good. I, I think there's been a development in um, more traditional security circles, business continuity, um, resilience, and even, even on a military side of um, our national security strategies, the, the concept of resilience was can we absorb a hit and then recover, reconstitute, and, and move on? And that's not going to be enough anymore, uh, particularly with hypersonic missiles, uh, the, the new um, potential for nuclear warfare. But we, we've known this for a while. NATO countries and their national security strategies have been adapting and, and moving to a, a more forward posture or, or offensive capabilities because it's simply not possible to just assume you can always absorb every hit you're going to take. Um, at the same time, China and Russia, and to, to get back to something you mentioned, um, China and Russia have treated their security disciplines in a very, very different way than the West has. They have, from a state level, uh, legislated and, and increased the sophistication of their security disciplines. For example, business continuity. Uh, we saw this with China when uh, Qualcomm uh, limited the, and, and the U.S. limited the availability of um, CPUs to the country. And as a strategic surprise, China came out with the Kirin 990. They had high silicon uh, company, which was a subsidiary uh, of another company that was developing these chips um, for nine years and taking a loss for nine years. And then when needed, they rolled it out and they called it strategic security. <laughs> That's not how the West treats uh, business continuity, for example. Um, but we're seeing it as well with Russia, with the financial sanctions. They were ready, maybe not as ready as they would like, and, and they're still taking some damage and suffering for sure out of this. Um, inflation went up to 20%, but it's been up there before after the um, move on Crimea. And so after Crimea in 2014, Russia took some very serious moves to um, mitigate against what they saw was a national security risk which was sanctions, economic sanctions. And so um, when they, some of the banks were moved out of the SWIFT, um, um, you know, I'm not a banker and I'm not an economist, so I'm probably gonna get the word wrong here, but the SWIFT program um, or platform, uh, they already had an alternate arranged. <laughs> not as good, not as fast, but they had an alternate arranged. And um, China as well had their SIPS program. Now, China has has moved back a little bit from um, the Russian economy to protect their own economy and all of this, but the um, damage to the economy uh, in Russia from the sanctions is already decreasing. This overwhelming sanction strategy may not be working as well as we thought or as long as we thought it would, and um, because they took these strategic mitigation steps and other steps along their supply chain. And so this is um, a very difficult thing when, when we're taking such different strategies in the West versus the East. And I think we are playing a little bit um, another departure from, from our, our traditional way of, of um, conducting warfare uh, as, as what we saw in counterinsurgency, where you have to get out ahead of the insurgents before they get too much of a, a hold on the population. It's a, it's a time problem. And I think we're seeing a bit of a time problem right now with, with the Russia-Ukraine situation and the sanctions of can, and this seems to be the strategy as I understand, and perhaps I'm wrong, but can you bankrupt Russia and get them to leave Ukraine? But if that doesn't work and the sanctions start to lose effect before Russia leaves, now we have a bigger problem. And so I, I think that time problem of how much pain can you put on people, and we saw it a little bit with the uh, the trucker convoy in Canada as well, where unprecedented economic sanctions were put on the protesters using the Emergency Measures Act, but very briefly, and uh, it got them to leave the area. Now, whether that's a test bed for this strategy in Russia or not, I have no idea. But the point is when you put such heavy economic sanctions on, you can't just turn the switch back on and we go back to normal. 
what will this do for collaboration with um, Russian law enforcement, Russian intelligence moving forward when we need them? Have we damaged those relationships with such heavy economic sanction strategy? I think those are longer run questions beyond getting Russia out of Ukraine in the very short run. Uh, and that's not something I hear a lot of discussion about is, is how do you back out of sanctions, uh, either because you decide they're not working or because you decide they've done their job. It's an interesting point. Does so anyone else want to weigh in on the, the sanction question in particular? I have a couple other things I want to talk about, but no? All right. Uh, I'm guessing you're pro-sanctions. Uh, give it yes. Absolutely. I can't imagine anyone in the room would disagree. Uh, we've had a lot of discussion in the first panel about um, sort of cl collab. But can I just add to something? And, Please. and I totally agree with uh, the points Bonnie's, Bonnie's raising for after this is over. Yeah. Right. So what's the plan at, and whether people have been thinking about the plan or not. But at this moment of the game, where a, a, a sovereign, independent country who was ally of ours and mm -hmm. we have strong ties, people to people ties, has been invaded, short of responding militarily, we have very little options but to go with the economic sanctions. And I think what's unprecedented about this time is the level of collaboration between like-minded countries mm -hmm. and the intensity, you called it on steroids, that we've seen snippets of it, we've seen different kinds of sanctions being put, not all agreeing on the kinds of sanctions being put. And this time around, you've seen a whole suite of sanctions being put together by the largest economies in the world against one actor. And that is that is significant, whether it's going to get us to the point where Russia says, okay, we're backing off. It needs some face saving as well. They put a lot on the line yeah. um, here as well. Um, but I don't see other alternative unless we just turn the other cheek, which I don't think was an option. No, I don't imagine anyone here would disagree with that. And I guess, I mean, a lot of this is, uh, and this is probably magical thinking, but a lot of this becomes uh, less of an issue if we were lucky enough to see regime change. Uh, but I don't imagine that we, well, I imagine we're becoming more pessimistic about that as, uh, as, as President Putin digs in and, and as the war continues. But we'll see. Uh, we talked of a lot in the first panel about uh, sort of at the law enforcement level, uh, cross-border uh, collaboration, international cooperation to combat cybercrime. Uh, we don't hear as much, and I know people in this room know about it, and we've talked about NATO already, uh, about what's being done uh, sort of at the national, sorry, at the international level, country to country. So between CSE and CSIS and its counterparts in America and elsewhere. Uh, to deal with uh, not just this crisis, but uh, to deal with these kinds of, uh, of uh, threats uh, just generally, the cyber warfare uh, threat in general? Yeah, I guess I'll start just by saying domestically, uh, I'm really proud of the way that the Canadian cyber ecosystem is really well stitched together. Mm -hmm. So I look out at this room and I, I see Eric and Chris and and uh, you know we meet every week at least once a week and many times i'll have sidebar conversations with them um, so I, I think that the government canada ecosystem is really robust in in making sure that we're deconflicting our actions and making sure that that we're not interfering with each other you'll you'll know the expression interlocking arcs of fire right we're making sure that our authorities are working complementary to chris's authorities which are working complementary to eric's authorities other actors as well. GAC is a key actor in that. So that we're not, that we're complementing each other and not undermining, inadvertently undermining efforts of the other person. So I think that that's happening nationally and also that's happening internationally. So we've always had a robust, um, you know, intelligence sharing arrangements with our allies. The Five Eye allies are our are, are family um, and we, we cooperate very closely with them. Right. Um, you know, certainly in, in my, and I, I won't presume to speak for, for CSE, but, but CSIS has robust intelligence sharing relationships on the cyber front with many, many actors. Institutionally, I think we're up to 400 arrangements uh, domestically in foreign arrangements with trusted partners that we can deal with. Uh, but in the cyber realm, you know, I would say the usual suspects are very aligned in, in how we're approaching things. Uh, and that gives me, and we need to do that because our adversaries are very, very strong and they're very big and they're very adept at what they do. And I had a meeting this morning with a foreign partner and we said, like, we can't afford to not be working together. And I, and I think Chris uh, said as much in, the, in his panel and Brian said as much in the panel, right? 
we are all like-minded liberal democracies. We all value the rule of law. We all value human rights. We all value free and open marketplaces. Um, so it's incumbent upon us to make sure that whatever minor variances and objectives between us and, and say, for example, the Americans exist, that we can work through that or, and get around that for the larger strategic objective of protecting those core values that we all share. And, and I do think, uh, again, and I won't speak for, for Eric's team, but our team, uh, we work very seamlessly with our, with our American and, and other 5i European and, and, and Asian partners. That's a very encouraging answer. Thank you for it. Um, I want to do a bit of a lightning round because we're coming to the end of our time. Uh, it's not a happy question, but maybe you can find a way to make it a happy question. Uh, we've talked a bit about you in particular, Bonnie. You've talked about sort of what the next threat that, uh, or maybe either we're seeing now already or we expect to see. What's the next uh, sort of threat in the cyber warfare uh, sort of ecosystem, whatever you want to call it, that you think we need to be preparing for and worrying about? Let's say it the other way, worrying about and preparing for. Uh, preparing for um, is when I think about cyber risk and how companies or organizations or governments are supposed to be dealing with this cyber risk in an environment where there's zero risk tolerance on one hand and huge risk on the other side and then big um, risk for, for blowback. Um, how, how does a company or, or a CSO, CISO prepare for this? And um, this is where it gets tricky because you can't protect everything. A, a company or a government has finite resources. And while there are plenty of attackers in the world and, and plenty of disgruntled players, you only have so many resources and so much attention and focus and time. And so somehow the cyber risk is going to have to be worked out on the back end of this because um, that's when the real world for companies hits. And um, that's, that's where it's at home and it gets very real day to day. Uh, and so this is, I think, going to be a real challenge moving forward if, uh, in this uncertain environment. Um, and this strategy won't work on China. Uh, China's, uh, the economic sanctions on China is a different story altogether. And so this is not the, the new way forward, the new kind of warfare that will be occurring in other areas. It's, it's I think, specific to this case um, in many ways. But how companies can deal with this, that adds another layer because now you're going to have to deal with this kind of blowback from Russia, Ukraine. But if things heat up with China, how are companies supposed to deal with that with a different strategy altogether and a different kind of warfare? It's getting very complex. And I'm glad to hear that the, uh, the systems are, are set up in Canada. And from the first panel today that the um, uh, our, our government organizations and law enforcement are working together and with our partners in the U.S. because I think we're going to need it down the road. It's getting more complex all the time. Thank you. Would you like to win? Yeah, certainly. What keeps me up at night nowadays is really that the uh, uh, every morning I'd like to know that everybody has been overnight uh, and um, um, how could I put it? Mind melted with the proper uh, cyber hygiene of protecting their passwords, knowing what to do with backups and recovery and so on. That would be awesome. Mm. But at, unfortunately, we're at that stage of educating the population and making sure everybody knows what they're doing. Because the, the, the wow effect of technology of nowadays, I mean, is open up the box, put your button on and it's, it's ready for you to use. But nobody reads any manual. Nobody knows how it does, what it happens, what's the communication protocol. Of course, nobody wants to know what a communication protocol. I know everybody would go to sleep with that. <laughs> but to that effect, uh, people should know how the interaction of data is flowing back and forth. That when you're in a room and your Bluetooth is open, you're susceptible to interception. And somebody can come over if the protocol is broken, taking over your phone, and so on and so on. And so on. I don't want to scare people with that, but that's the reality of things. So that said, if people just know about that's proper cyber hygiene, and I when I did uh, some uh, public speaking and uh, I go to schools, we talk with children and all, I bring them the uh, the subject to compare with, do you share your toothbrush with your, your partner? Do you share your underwears with your, your best friend and so on? Well, 
don't do the same with your password. Don't do the same with your IT uh, uh, knowledge and uh, share the, your tricks on how to secure your environment. That's true. But please uh, change your password often and so on. So it's that common uh, knowledge that, that people have to go and uh, make sure they're aware of that. We're talking about, uh, I believe it's your uh, siblings that uh, had the, the, that password or the protection on, your, on the pad. Um, that's, that's the kind of thing. I mean, we're the knowledgeable one who have to transfer that knowledge uh, and people will eventually uh, put it to good use. Right, and hopefully people are changing their underwear regularly as well. I hope so. Absolutely, yes. <laughs> uh, anyone else want to weigh in on this? So so what keeps me up in the night, I think that's sort of yeah, the question please. you were asking, and, and I think it's become, it's growing uh, in speed. The, the new uh, form of cyber warfare is the proliferation and impact of disinformation. Mm. And going back to Sean's point around some of the core values that we hold as a society, which is respect, peace, uh, hum human rights, uh, our democratic institutions. We live in a society where we are free to disagree with each other, but we've always have acted from same uh, set of facts. And then we can parse them apart and say this, this, this path is better than that path. But when you've got a whole different alternative reality that's being built, and we know that is being created uh, by actors that we we may not know, um, that is a huge issue, and it's it's no longer I don't think fiction anymore. We saw that in the United States in, you know, on January sixth mm -hmm. by seeing a direct attack on their national democratic institution. We saw that happen in our nation's capital. A year later, we never thought that would that would happen. Um, uh, that's a serious issue. So I know we spend a lot of time talking about cyber attacks and cyber, cyber warfare. I think information is probably one of the most important uh, assets we've got, one of the most important uh, resources we've got. And when you start distorting information and 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 dupe people in believing things that are not true at all, we've got a serious issue. And that's where education is going to become so much important because I don't think any law uh, uh, that parliament would pass could stop the proliferation of disinformation. There's a bit of a shared responsibility that needs to happen. That's what really keeps me up in the night. Thank you for that, because we talk about foreign disinformation in this context, but we don't talk enough about the domestic uh, uh, issue as well. So that's, that's well put, thank you. Yeah, I'll totally echo what Yasser said. I think that's bang on, that's something to, to be concerned about. Um, I look around, I see some older people in the audience. At the end of the Cold War, two big books came out, you know, with the, the view of what the future would be. One was by Francis Fukuyama, The End of History and The Last Man, and the other was by Samuel uh, Huntington, and it was A Clash of Civilizations. Mm. And what keeps me up at night is the fact that we're very, very clearly veering towards that second book. And, and Bonnie's alluded to it before. And we're at the danger now of finding ourselves into these competing power blocks, which is the erosion of the liberal order that was created after the Second World War and then kind of reinforced at the end of the Cold War. And, and we're going to see supply chains contract back in uh, with all the con con concomitant economic loss, lost opportunity and things like that. So cyber worries me, but cyber is just a tool. It's just a tool that adversaries worry. I'm strategically worried that we're that we're moving backwards in history. Hmm. So that happy note. Yay! Go sends go. <laughs> uh, well, it's a serious, as we said before, it's a serious discussion for serious minds, and and, and it's been very illuminating. Thank you so much for for joining us today, and thanks for for sharing your thoughts on this. Uh, excellent work. Appreciate it. Okay, before we go. Hi, perfect. I am Lynn Hamilton. I am the president of the Internet Society Canada chapter. It's my job today to just say thank you once again to the fabulous folks at AWS for hosting us today and allowing us to do this incredible discussion. Obviously, the Embassy of the United States to Ambassador Cohen, Minister Mendicino, Yasser, thank you for spending your time with us today. It couldn't be more timely and uh, or more important, really. Um, today would not have happened if it wasn't for Franca Palazzo, our fabulous executive director. We thank her for everything that she did. It's a tremendous effort working with so many partners. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention some of the our board members are in the room. 
Lena Trudeau, uh, Phil Palmer, our chair, Timothy Denton, Brent, our fabulous moderator today, is also our secretary. Thank you so much for everything, Brent, for keeping it going and keeping us on time. And uh, again, if anyone wishes to become a partner of the society, let me, obviously, we, you know, we can chat over a much needed drink uh, and we can chat about that. Um, I'm very excited to have that drink after this conversation. And finally, <laughs> woo, uh, happy talk. Um, as you can always get, we do wonderful work at this society and these conversations are on the regular. So if you'd like to become a member, please talk to us about that as well. Uh, we would welcome you to, to the society and uh, we always need need more uh, hands on deck for the work that we do and uh, to the bar thank you <laughs> oh one last thing I did see Byron Holland here uh, from CIRA. They're one of our most original sponsors that got the society together probably seven or eight hour, uh, seven, eight years ago. Uh, we couldn't be here today if it wasn't for those early sponsors and uh, we couldn't be more glad to see him. So thank you.